Right. Uh, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of the further hearing sessions being held in respect of the examination of the uh, Baber and Mid Suffolk Joint Local Plan. <clears throat> Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Rivett and along with my colleague Alison Partington, um, I've been appointed uh, by the Secretary of State uh, to examine the uh, plan for soundness and legal compliance. Um, just before we start the discussion today, um, there's a few uh, household, uh, well, sorry, housekeeping uh, points I need to run through. Um, Firstly, just to remind everybody, uh, I think Annette's covered it already, but uh, just to avoid disruption during the proceedings, if people could uh, keep their microphones uh, off when they're uh, not uh, speaking, please. Um, it's up to you whether you have your um, cameras on or off. Um, but I would ask um, if the main council uh, speakers, if you could perhaps keep your uh, micro, uh, your cameras on please it's just um because otherwise i'm talking to a blank screen at times which is um not the easiest of, uh, of things to do um i'm sure most of you are now very familiar uh with events held on uh microsoft teams but just a few reminders um firstly just to say that the uh, proceedings are being um, both live streamed to YouTube and recorded, so you should be aware of that. Um, and also anybody who chooses to make their own recording of the proceedings, uh, be grateful if you would ensure you comply with the law um, in terms of any distribution of that recording that you choose to make. Um, if you'd like to uh, contribute to the discussion, uh, please use the raise hand facility. I think Annette's been through that with uh, everybody. So hopefully um, you all know where um, that is. Um, and then when you do speak, uh, grateful if you could put your uh, microphone on, um, obviously, because otherwise we can't hear you um, and your uh, camera, um, uh, preferably. OK. Um, and just to say, um, be grateful if everybody would keep their contributions as brief and uh, concise as possible. Um, propose to take a short 15 minutes or so break uh, mid morning and then we'll uh, end this morning at around probably around one o'clock. Um, assuming we do need to carry on this afternoon, we'll start again uh, at about uh, two o'clock. I'll confirm the precise times um, when we break for um, lunch. Um, just before we start the discussion today, I thought it might be useful just to remind people um, as to how we've reached this point um, in the examination. Appreciate for people that aren't working for the council or uh, uh, the inspectors. Um, it, you, you might have forgotten and not been following it um, as closely as we have. Um, but basically, in summary, um, I'm sure you'll recall that in the summer and autumn of 2021, um, we held hearing sessions into a number of aspects um, of the plan. Um, and as a result of those, um, we wrote to the councils setting out our significant concerns um, about the plan soundness, particularly uh, in relation to the housing site selection process um, and the related uh, spatial strategy, the two of those being uh, uh, very much interlinked. Um, to address these concerns, we suggested modifying the plan uh, to become a part one plan, um, and that would involve deleting from it the housing site allocations and the spatial strategy, um, and that they would be matters to be dealt with in a part two plan. Um, and the context for this suggestion, um, which the councils um, agreed to pursue and amended their um, local development scheme accordingly, but the context for that was that the majority of the plan period housing requirement across uh, the plan area um, is already accounted for by housing commitments. That's uh, sites with uh, planning permission or outline consent. Um, we also uh, indicated at that stage that in the light of the written evidence and the hearings that we'd already held, um, that there were a range of other modifications to other aspects of the plan that were necessary, mostly the uh, development management uh, policies. 
Um, so in the light of all that, the council subsequently prepared um, and then considered through sustainability appraisal and habitats regulations assessment, um, the necessary main modifications to the plan. Uh, and earlier this year, those modifications were then subject to uh, public consultation. And we received um, a number of uh, representations into response to those. Um, in relation to the vast majority of the main modifications and the representations, we're um, happy that we can uh, consider those representations and whether or not we need to adjust the main modifications in the light of those um, through just written, written, written representations. Um, so we don't need to discuss those. However, we did feel it would be useful to have further discussion on a number of specific um, points and um, they are the uh, subject of these hearing sessions this week. Just to remind you uh, briefly, um, these are uh, the, the, the issues are the modification of the plan from a full local plan to a part one plan and change to the settlement boundaries. That's the subject of the discussion today. Um, the proposed intensive livestock and poultry farming policy and the protection of open spaces. Um, that's matters that will be considered tomorrow. Um, and then on Wednesday, um, we will be uh, discussing probably fairly briefly uh, Natural England's comments on the main modifications and the habitats regulations assessment. So that's just to give you a bit of a summary as to how we've um, reach the point where we are um, now, but I do wish to emphasise that we will only be discussing these specific matters, so it's not an opportunity to talk more widely about the plan. Um, the format uh, of the hearing will be uh, a structured discussion which I shall lead. You should have all seen the agenda which sets out um, some bullet points um, and we'll go through uh, those. I am proposing um, to make one adjustment to the order of the um, agenda, which I will mention just now. Um, I'm proposing that uh, agenda item one we'll deal with at the end um, and go through from two to I think it's nine um, first and then do number one. The reasons for that um, is that I think quite a few of the issues that might get raised under um, item one by one or two participants um, are matters that other people may touch uh, are, are on under the other matters. So I think it probably makes more sense to go that way. Um, so we'll start with number two, go to nine and then deal with number one um, at the at the end. Um, just to say all previously submitted written evidence is taken as read, so you don't need to repeat that uh, at length. So basically, uh, the purpose of today is for me to ask questions um, uh, about uh, Sorry. the written evidence. Are you happy? Uh, ask questions about the written evidence um, and for you to, uh, you know, uh, answer those questions. Um, in a moment, I'll ask everybody to uh, introduce themselves. But has anybody, just before I do that, has anybody got any procedural questions at this point? If you could just use the raise hands if you have. No, um, seemingly not, that's fine. So we'll go to introductions then. Um, what I'll do is start with the council's team and then I will uh, go around everybody using uh, the list I've got. So it'll be in that order. But if I turn to the council first and let you, whoever, wh whatever order you wish to introduce yourselves or how you wish to do that. So uh, if the council could introduce themselves, please. So perhaps if I start, um, yeah. I'm Michael Bedford, King's Council, I'm the legal advisor assisting the council in relation to the um, plan and then um, primarily uh, speaking today will be Mr Matt Deakin uh, who obviously you're familiar with from uh, the sessions in 2021 together with uh, Mr Dan Malloy uh, and then also uh, on your screen at the moment uh, you can see um, Mr Barker and Mr Hobbs. Um, I'm not at the moment expecting they'll necessarily be speaking today, but obviously they're available if necessary. And you'll also see uh, on your screen is Councillor uh, Stringer, uh, who is um, also on the call. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not uh, necessarily expecting that he'll be participating directly, uh, but just so people know that uh, those are the, uh, the main participants uh, from the Council. 
Thank you, sir. OK, thank you very much. Um, so we'll then go down uh, the list of other participants. Um, so first of all, uh, if you could perhaps just, uh, uh, I'll introduce you by name, but if you could perhaps just um, uh, say uh, who you're representing, that would be helpful. So first of all, uh, Mr. Adrian Ward. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Adrian Ward, Parish Councillor, Copdock and Washbrook. OK, thank you. Um, then we've got uh, Mr. Allman. Hello, um, I'm not representing anyone, but I have been working on the Hadley Neighbourhood Plan Subcommittee. OK, so you're representing yourself uh, uh, as such, yes. Uh, OK, um, Mr. Johnston, Colin Johnston. Um, hello, uh, Colin Johnston, Shimpling Parish Council. OK, thank you. Um, Mr. David Jones. Hello, David Jones from Armstrong Rig Planning, representing Hopkins Homes. OK, thank you. Um, and then we've got the Gladman House meeting room. Sounds very grand. Uh, good morning, sir. Stuart Carvel from Gladman Developments. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, Isaac Jolly. Mr. Jolly. No. no. Inspector, I, I think there's a couple of people just having connection issues. They keep falling in and out. So um, I will let them back into the meeting once right. I have the opportunity. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, James Lawson. Somebody else who's fallen out of the meeting, maybe. Um, Jamie Martin Edwards. Good morning, sir. Uh, you're joined uh, this morning by uh, Suzanne Nugent, Jamie Martin Edwards, and myself, James Bailey. Uh, we're here on behalf uh, of Taylor Wimpy, uh, and, and our business is called James Bailey Planning. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. So that was uh, Jasmine Philpot as well, was it? I, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, OK, um, ah, Mr Lawson, Mr Lawson, you're back. Yes, apologies, sir. Um, yes, James Lawson, acting for M Chisnell Builders, uh, Hadley based builders and contractors. Thank you. <coughs> OK, thank you. Um, we've got Kerry. Presume Kerry has a second name. Again, Inspector, we've got people dropping in and out, and I oh, think they right. come in via um, other um, participants in their office. So I don't recognise the name, but I know it's from, um, I think it's Persimmon, actually, that okay. one. But um, I think um, we'll wait for them to come into the meeting. Yeah, OK. Uh, Louis Harris or Lewis Harris. Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, Louis Harris from Taylor Wimpy. OK, thank you. Uh, Mark Edgley. Good morning, sir. My name is Mark Edgeley. Uh, I work for Boyer Planning and we're here representing Taylor Wimpy also. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it Odil uh, Vladen, is it? Vladen? Morning, Odile Vladon. I'm representing two, two councils, um, Thorndon Parish Council and Stradbroke Parish Council. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Rihanna Kriwoma, Womia. I mean, Inspector, that's that's my um, assistant here who's able to oh. live stream for me. So oh, right. Sorry. OK, fine. That's fine. Um, Richard Brown. Good, good morning, sir. Uh, Richard Brown, Richard Brown Planning. I act for Harris Strategic Land Promoting Sites in the District, sir. OK, thank you. Uh, Richard Wandsborough. Uh, morning. Uh, yeah, Richard Winsborough, uh, Planning Director at uh, M Scott Properties, a uh, local land promoter. OK, thank you. We've got a lot of Richards and a lot of Roberts, um, which on my uh, list of screens is confusing me slightly. But anyway, um, Robert Barber. 
Morning, sir. Rob Barber, uh, Pegasus Group, uh, representing Ballamore Group and Mr. and Mrs. Price and Persimmon uh, with interest at Hadley. Thank you. OK, um, changing the name, but st sticking with uh, R, Rory Baker. Good morning, sir. Rory Baker, um, planning consultant for Fraser Halls Associates, acting on behalf of Mr. N and P Rouse. OK, thank you. And then I think finally, uh, Turley Cambridge MTR. I'm fascinated to know what MTR stands for. A probably meeting room. <laughs> you correctly identified that, Inspector. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sophie Payne from Turley here, representing my client Simon at the Fimbo from Pigeon and their associated landowners. Okay, thank you. I think that's everybody. Is there anybody who I've missed out who who is planning to speak? Oh, uh, Mr. Dixon. Good morning, sir. Yes, I was uh, following your track down the list. Uh, well done for keeping track. Uh, Jonathan Dixon from Savills on behalf of Endurance Estates. Right. OK, thank you. Is Oh, uh, anybody else? No. OK, um, <clears throat> well, that's, uh, that, that's very good. So um, thank you for that. Let's uh, start uh, the meat of the discussion then. Um, as I say, we'll follow the agenda apart from we'll move straight to uh, agenda point two um, and come back to one later. Um, and agenda item two concerns the content and timing um, of uh, the part two plan and uh, what, if anything, more the part one plan um, should say about that. Um, the first uh, bullet point question is, should the part one plan set out clear timescales and content for the part two plan? Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, a number of uh, representations um, argue uh, this point. Um, suppose my question, uh, not to anybody in particular, but to people who've made this point is, um, would would this have if if the plan was to the part one plan was to say something very specific in a policy about the plan will the part two plan will follow this time scale and it will um will have this content would that have any force um in practice um i mean um whatever a local plan says for example a part one plan says about what a part two plan should say it's the local development scheme that um a uh, any plan submitted for examination has to be legally um in accordance with um and um that the local development scheme was, is within the gift of the council and can be changed by the council uh, as as and when it sees fit so W w would it, whilst recognising that you're all very keen um, for the part two plan uh, to come forward as quickly as possible and have got strong views about what it should, should and shouldn't uh, contain, would it actually achieve anything by um, putting anything um, specifically, a specific policy to say this? Anybody like to comment on um, on that question? I thought I was a bit surprised. I thought I would see 78 hands go up. Uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, you'll start us off. Uh, although you need to put your uh, microphone on. So good morning. Um, yeah, specifically, so as you say, qu question two, um, sh should the plan have uh, clear timescales uh, and so on, and consequences. Um, <clears throat> my answer, sir, is is yes. Um, it, if the plan is to be split in this way, um, uh, otherwise the council's uh, the council may simply delay plan two uh, indefinitely. And and I also believe that there there should be consequences for the part one plan if the part two plan is delayed, uh, just as with a plan that's found. Uh, sound and adopted, for example, subject to an early review. OK, so we'll come on to the consequences in a second, although the two are probably um, a sort of <laughs> inherently interlinked. But e e e even if the plan had a policy saying um, the 
uh, you know, the part two plan must be um, submitted for examination by X date and it must contain uh, the following um, things. Um, what happens if, and we're probably moving on to consequences, but we'll we'll deal with them together. What happens um the council doesn't do that? What 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 can be done? Well well I think it would <clears throat> I think it would follow so that the if 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 what you said occurs, the it seems to me that the policies in plan one that are reliant upon Plan two being adopted, they're obviously then, in my opinion, uh, would carry little, if any, weight, particularly those relating to uh, housing. Right. OK. Um, one, I, 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 no doubt I see some other hands going up, um, but I'll I'll respond to that sort of point first of all, and then we'll we'll. Um, uh, 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 open up more widely. I suppose um, one of the issues with making the policies out of uh, date is what the council could do and a number of councils in response to policies of the type that you talk about and I have um, I have history of, uh, of, of inserting such policies in plans that were adopted myself um, but one of the uh, possible outcomes is that the council then just submits a plan which just seeks to change that policy um, and then that policy gets changed so it hasn't achieved anything uh, 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 at, at all really has it. Um, uh, do you have a comment on that? <clears throat> Well, I think I would agree with that, sir. Um, it, we're going to come back, obviously, to one, but uh, it just seems to me that the part one plan needs to sort of set out strategic policies and and, and, and settlement hierarchy. Um, I, I don't think that they can be delayed uh, uh, until part two. OK, uh, thanks for that. Um, Mr Dixon. Thank you. I think it, it, it's a difficult question, this, because you've, by way of your responses to Mr. Brown, just highlighted some of the issues that we're trying to grapple with. Fundamentally, the plan is supposed to be a plan for the plan period. And we've noted in our representations that it sets out the total housing requirement for that plan period. But it doesn't include enough sites to meet that uh, that requirement. So it is not that we are considering part one of a plan and then sorry, plan one and then plan two. We are considering part one and part two. They are both integral to the creation of a total plan. I take your point. I have been through similar experiences elsewhere, and um, I suspect I know what Michael Bedford is going to be saying following me. However, if there is nothing in this plan that requires the council to immediately progress with a part two plan, and noting what you said about the LDS, then there's less pressure on the councils to get on with it. And given the, con given the context that we've got of revisions to the NPPF and so on and so forth, it would be very easy for them, possibly politically, to delay. And in this consequence, having something more strongly than currently proposed written into the part one plan, requiring them to get on with part two and setting out what it should include, rather than the current suggestion that here's a list of things that it is likely to consider, would actually give everybody a bit more certainty that we are going to get a part two plan in good time. So I take everything you've said into account, but I think at the moment it's a very weak requirement for them to get on with part two. Right. OK, um, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the council at the end. Uh, Mr Edgeley. Thank you, sir. Um, I, th I think, um, yes, yeah, so certainly just fo following on from, from the last speaker there, um, I think the, the benefit of setting out a sort of clear time scale 
is that it shows the, the the kind of commitment from the council to actually un, undergo um and and prepare their their, their sort of the, the next plan or their part two or however it ends up uh you know sort, sort of being imagined in in the in the future lds um as and when they come you know i think we're we're all aware um yeah that there has been delays in in the plan making progress um and i think that that's been quite long-standing some of them delays you know you just have to look at some of the uh the dates of some of the existing live policies that both authorities have so i think from our point of view having um a clear time scale in actually just shows the that the council's commitment it actually gives something um to hold them to account against uh, granted, uh, to take your point from earlier around the, the legal requirements and the test is against the local development scheme. But as, as we all know, that that can be amended sort of as and when local authorities uh, wish. Um, in in light of the sort of recent political changes that we've seen within the authorities as well, um, you know, it, our, our view is that providing that sort of clear time scale in in this plan um as as it moves forward you know ensures that we have that sort of timely delivery um of of, of sites um and development and ultimately can guide the uh, the guide the growth um and future provision of services and infrastructure across the authorities thank okay you. uh thank you um gladman Um, yes, thank you, sir. Um, I think I share some of your well, points you raised there about what's the what's the requirement for them to do it. But essentially, what is the hook for the council to do it? Um, there's obviously going to be a legal requirement for the council to review their plan anyway, and they've fairly clearly set out their case that they essentially consider they have all the housing requirement up to throughout the plan period, particularly in mid Suffolk, um, and essentially they don't need to do anything until 2030. Um, already five years post the base date of the plan, and they say they leave you up to review it within five years anyway, post adoption. Um, and so I just, I, I'm not sure what the benefit of benefit, but what's the benefit for the council to do it? And in this council, we sort of have a history of it, of it happening in mid Suffolk. Um, in their core strategy, they were supposed to produce a site allocations plan that never happened. They did an area action plan for Stone Market, but no site allocations document was ever produced. So, in just in terms of history. Um, this council has failed to do that previously, so I don't have any confidence that it will happen again this time, particularly when they set out their stall that they don't need to do anything full stop until at least post-2030. OK, that, so is that saying, uh, I mean, I, I suspect that that, that, uh, that really relates to your sort of wider comment on the plan as a whole, uh, well, uh, uh, as to whether or not um, it, it's so fundamentally flawed, which we'll come back to under uh, point one. But are you saying if it were to go ahead uh, as a part two plan, are you saying it sh it should have uh, 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 a specific policy requirement in for the part two? Or you are you saying actually that th there's not much point? It doesn't really matter either way. Um, just so I'm, I'm clear. Saying, uh, I'm saying, yes, it would be help beneficial to guide the to guide the council right. to do it. But I'm concerned that it doesn't have any legal hooks. Yeah. OK. Right, OK, that, that's uh, helpful. Uh, Odile uh, Vladon. Hi, um, I just thought I should maybe have a voice for the non-developers in the on the call. Um, there are site allocations in Mid Suffolk. They're called neighbourhood plans. Um, so to say that there are no sites allocated is incorrect. They are made adopted neighbourhood plans. And I think that there are more coming forward. So, you know, it, Making them making Mid Suffolk and Baber put a timetable in that is not necessarily something they have to stick to seems to me like a lot of work for not not a lot of outcome. Um, they have shown that they have a five year land supply. There are neighbourhood plans coming forward. Most of the neighbourhood plans have sites allocated and those sites are driven by um, the needs of the local area, not the needs of the landowners and developers. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. And um, Mr Baker. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, our comments relate more broadly to 
the content of the part two local plan with regards to um, the matters it should cover and in specifically a review mechanism um, for the evidence base. Is this uh, an appropriate time to speak on this or would you prefer me uh, later on in the agenda? Um, probably later on, is this to yeah. do with the, the sort of um, the, the age of the evidence base type yeah. of thing? Yes, yes. Uh, pro yeah. probably yeah. later on under under uh, question one, probably part one. Yeah, that's fine. OK, thank you, Inspector. Not a problem. OK, thank you. Um, OK, uh, Mr Bedford. Thank you, sir. Michael Bedford for the uh, two councils. So I'll bring in Mr. Deakin for perhaps some more practical um, comments on the on the process in a moment. But could I just perhaps, in terms of context, um, so you, you, you in your introductory remark um, recognised um, uh, as is the case, the role of the local development scheme uh, in determining uh, what plans should be produced and setting out a timetable for their production. Uh, and the timetable for the production of um, DPDs is a requirement of a local development scheme. So uh, when the legislation was enacted, the structure envisages that the timetable is absolutely something that should be dealt with uh, through the LDS as opposed to through uh, the DPDs themselves. Um, secondly, it's it's not, we would say, um, uh, correct to say that the LDS mechanism is, is itself toothless. Um, it, it, it's absolutely right that the local planning authorities can review their LDSs uh, at times that are appropriate uh, to them if they think that the LDS should be reviewed. But it shouldn't be forgotten uh, that uh, the Secretary of State does have overseeing powers in relation to uh, an LDS, both uh, in section 15, subsection 4. If there isn't an LDS, he can require one to be made. And if there is an LDS, this is uh, section 15, subsection 8. Uh, he can um, require changes to be made to an LDS if he considers it necessary to do so. So whilst obviously it's unusual for the Secretary of State to get involved in the, as it were, fine tuning of a local authority's plan making function, uh, nonetheless, the, as it were, the, the Act envisages that ultimately if you had a local authority that was sitting on its hands, which seems to be the implication of some of the comments you've heard this morning, then that's a matter that the Secretary of State is amply able uh, to require to be corrected uh, by imposing on the local authority a requirement to um, change their LDS and he can direct how it should be changed. Um, and you will also obviously be aware, sir, as again, I think you made it clear from your opening remarks that section 19, subsection one, of the 2004 Act um, uh, requires compliance with the LDS. So that's that's in a sense the way that the uh, the legislation uh, works. Um, I think perhaps uh, it, it, having sort of reminded, um, as it were, everybody of that um, background context, if I then just bring in Mr Deakin, so perhaps talk practically about what actually the council is uh, wishing to do and how it's uh, proposing to deliver on the on the part two plan. Thank you. Uh, hello, good morning. Um, yes, so I, th I think the council's main position is uh, the, the LDS effectively remains there an appropriate vehicle to um, manage the timetable and the content of the part two plan. But nevertheless, the modifications that have been made to the part one document itself um, do set out in the council's opinion a clear path in terms of the cover, uh, the um, the issues to be covered. Uh, and indeed, some of that work has already actually begun. Um, so there is some commissioning work already being done on some of the evidence base um, and, uh, you know, contracts have already been secured to pr progress with just some of that work. Um, so it's in, in terms of uh, the content and, and the comments around the likelihood of those matters to be revisited, it absolutely is the council's intention to pick up the the, uh, the items that are listed 
uh, for the part two document. And indeed, there may be more um, items that come onto the agenda as well. So in the meantime, um, as, as we've discussed in the hearings, there, there does remain a very large uh, supply of committed housing uh, supply. Um, and in terms of consequences, I think the council's view is that there are um, there are already mechanisms in place through the MPBF and plan review um, and through um, consequences to housing land supply and housing delivery test, uh, both of which the councils have very strong positions on um, that effectively can take care or can ensure that uh, objective needs can be met in the in the most effective way. OK, um, thank you for that. Um, in terms of the consequences, I think we've, I mean, people have already talked about that, um, but I just wanted to uh, ask a question in relation to that. Um, uh, I mean, the, the main consequence I think people have either referred to or is the sort of obvious one, um, if can if if there were to be a policy setting out uh, the time scale for the plan uh, for the part two plan and if that weren't to be met and i think that consequence would probably be that the policy is probably for the supply of housing at least or maybe something else as well would be considered um uh out of uh date is there any other has anybody got i just want to check whether anybody else has got anything uh additional to that that they uh think um or, or alternative to that that they think could be a consequence or is that you know the policies for the supply of housing become out of date is that the consequence that people have been talking about just looking at uh, the council going to speak but nobody else is putting their hand up so i'm presuming that that is the consequence people are thinking about. Um, Councillor Stringer. Thank you. Some, someone mentioned the word political, so I thought I might as well just make a comment. Uh, from this part of the administration, being that portfolio holder, it is utter imperative that we move on uh, and make sure this plan is completed in all parts, uh, not just for housing requirements, but as the inspector has rightly picked up, for social justice uh, requirements as well. Um, so th there are a number of reasons why uh, it is a political imperative that this plan is, is a, a very high priority for this new administration. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Hobbs. Thank you, sir. I, I hadn't mentioned it because um, I felt Mr Deacon gave a very um, good answer to the previous question. But just to reassure on the back of what Councillor Stringer has just said, um, both councils are keen on the part two plan. We've been, as Mr Deacon has alluded to, we've been working on evidence behind the part two plan alongside the part one plan. And so any um, concerns that we won't do a part two plan are misguided. OK, OK. Um, right. Well, I think that probably deals. Oh, uh, Mr Bedford. Yes, I just wanted to make a, a final um, point, um, just because again, it's, it, it, there is a slight legal point, and I don't certainly want to get too bogged down in it. But you will no doubt again be aware that the courts have drawn a distinction between that concept of whether something is up to date or out of date, and then the concept of how much weight can be given to uh, something. Um, and the courts have been clear that even policies which are thought or found to be out of date can still carry um, significant degrees of weight if the decision maker making a particular decision thinks that they should. So I so say even even if you, as it were, write into a plan that so and so should be regarded as out of date, that doesn't actually deal with the weight question, because the weight question, which is actually the important question, is always a bespoke planning judgment depending on the particular circumstances at the particular time so um, in, in, in a sense it's a little bit illusory uh, to get too um, bogged down in describing things as out of date because i say the important thing is what weight should policies carry and that will always be case specific depending on the circumstances at the time so that was just a final sort of point just to bear in mind thank you sir OK, uh, thank you. Right, um, let's move on then to uh, agenda point three, which is whether it's necessary and feasible for the part one plan to set out a spatial strategy. Um, 
just to be specific here, I, I, I'm, I, I know uh, uh, many people, <laughs> probably, well, <laughs> probably the council of two, uh, would think that ideally the plan uh, should have a spatial strategy. And so it, it's it, it's not that is not the uh, the point for discussion. It's whether or not accepting the, the fact that it is a part one plan, whether or not it is feasible, um, given the current circumstances, for it to have some element of a uh, a spatial strategy in in it. Um, there's been a number of comments on this which say that, well, the transport corridors, surely they could be mentioned as um, something that would form part of a spatial strategy. Equally, um, the uh, uh, Ipswich Fringe, the market towns and core villages, arguments that they should be uh, retained and identified in the plan as um, as sort of key elements of a of a spatial strategy where development should be focused. Um, my thoughts on those and where I ask the question really is, uh, yes, I understand that, and yes, one would have thought it's likely that in due course the um, spatial strategy for the plan area will probably focus on transport corridors and on the Ipswich fringe and probably market towns and probably core villages so it's probably likely to do that but and at this stage that be said can you come up with part of a spatial strategy without coming up with the whole of it type of thing and one of the problems is can you come up with a spatial strategy that's realistic without having identified uh the sites um the housing sites to um fulfill that spatial strategy because otherwise you end up potentially with this perfect spatial strategy but then find it's not deliverable because there aren't any suitable sites to deliver it so can, can, is it feasible given that the plan is not going to set out housing allocations is it feasible to say anything about the spatial strategy i suppose that's my uh question is anybody wanting to comment on on that point Mr. Jones. Thank you, sir. Um, I think my first point is that it, it very much should include a spatial strategy or all plans should include a spatial strategy um, in order to be in accordance with the National Planning Policy Framework. I mean, yeah. it, it's in the presumption of favour of sustainable development. Yeah. All plans we'll, we'll, should have a sustainable pattern of development. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that's not your direct question. Um, we'll come on to that in, uh, a bit later, but yeah, in terms of the uh, in terms of where, where we are in, now, in terms of whether this plan can, in terms of the additional work required to get to that point, and the flaws in the evidence base already identified, and the fact we're already at only fourteen years of plan period left, I think it would not be possible or feasible to do that in a sound manner. But I do think that it should be included, and therefore I think that the plan cannot be found sound. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Anybody? Nobody else on this. Did the council want to comment on this? I don't particularly need anything from the council, but it was just if if you wanted to say something. No. Uh, sorry. Sorry. So yes, I was only going to um, effectively answer. The first part of your question, I have absolutely nothing to say further on feasibility, but the question that you'd posed, certainly in the agenda, also dealt with the question of whether it's necessary. And I'd simply say that the answer is purely from a legal point of view, no, it's not necessary, even if it might be, as I think we've recognised, preferable or desirable in an ideal world. And the reason why it's not necessary is very simply that section 19 subsection one capital c makes can, can it, i hold can i just yeah. hold you there because otherwise i know yeah. um that uh, probably gladman and hopkins homes are what's yeah. going to want to come back uh, on you on that and that's probably something to discuss under question one because i think it goes to that heart of to whether or not the plan is uh is so flawed or not type of thing but and, well, and well, you, uh, you uh, rightly yeah. you rightly pick up that, that when i say it, is it necessary that was probably a it was probably a a a, a not very good choice of words um i wasn't meaning it in as a legal sense in that sense right. but i think in that in terms of that point of as to whether or not it is legally necessary we can yeah. uh, come to that um under question one if that's okay or, or or i mean is it specifically in relation to to this sort of question two point that you were going to sorry well question three point you were going to make or is it more widely about whether or not the 
plan overall is flawed and your argument as to why yeah. it isn't. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't, I wasn't going to deal with that wider question. Right. I, I just wanted to make a very simple point, which is that what Section 19, when it talks about um, strategic priorities and policies uh, to be included in a plan, makes it clear that should be uh, a matter for the plans taken as a whole. I, it's this point of recognising you can have more than one DPD to deliver on the task of setting out your strategic priorities and policies. So in other words, it's not necessary for each individual DPD to do the whole job. It's perfectly recognised in the way that Section 19 works, that it's the suite as a whole that do it, which is why it uses that phrase taken as a whole, which is written into the language of the legislation. So that was the simple point. I'm not going to deal with, yes, as you say, the wider point, uh, but simply to make the point that, yes, it's perfectly legally permissible to do it in the way that the main modifications recommend uh, at the moment uh, that it is to be done. OK, thank you. And Mr Deacon. Yes, thank you. I think it was just a point in insofar as people wish to understand what the general pattern of development in the district is going to, you know, going to look like for the next uh, 10 or 10 or 15 years obviously with a vast majority vast majority of committed supply already found then that that is well understood in terms of what the what the bulk of uh, the, the supply will look like uh, in spatial terms okay uh thank you and um, mr brown yeah so thank you um so i um i wanted to just touch upon um paragraph 20 of the framework and also 60 but sh sh do you, would you like me to deal with that in question one i think so probably better i i, I for all that mr bedford said i knew this would head down into into question one so um uh, and mr barber is uh is yeah th thank you sir just a, a very quick point uh following on from mr deakin's point um whilst uh, he makes the the the, the point that most of the bulk of the commitments are already found. That's certainly the case for Mid Suffolk. There continues to be a shortfall in Baber. And surely there needs to be some kind of strategic direction to loot, uh, in terms of a spatial strategy for that shortfall that needs to be found within part two. OK. Um, I mean, I suppose that that moves neatly into question four which terms about you know uh is the allocation of housing sites in the part one plan uh, re uh required which some people are arguing that it is um i, I, I know your, your 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 point there was about spatial strategy but i think the two are interlinked and i think the point you uh you've raised there mr barber will probably come out in this discussion as well so but thank you for that we'll move on to question four then which is is the allocation of housing sites in the part one plan over and above the existing commitments um, summarised in uh, table three um, uh, necessary for the plan to be sound. So are more uh, sites necessary for the plan to be sound? Um, I think there's two arguments that have been put on this. One, um, the uh, more sites are needed to be allocated uh, to ensure that the affordable housing needs are met. Um, and then secondly, that um, some looking more widely over uh, all housing, some housing, uh, some existing commitments may not actually be de developed. But talking about um, talking about affordable housing um, first, um, it, the arguments that have, have been put forward in the written representations are that existing commitments won't deliver the affordable housing, um, but. If you look at the uh, the housing data, which is now a year old, um, well, more than a year old, but that, that's been published on the council's um, website, um, that at sort of about five years into the 20 year plan period in mid Suffolk, um, about 120 percent of the plan period affordable housing target is already met through uh, commitments and I think the figures show that 75% of it has already been that the how the affordable housing requirement has already been uh, completed so that makes me think 
is there a need for, for for more housing to be allocated at this stage to ensure affordable housing needs are met when seemingly the needs are, uh, the identified needs are, uh, are almost met already? In Baber, the situation isn't quite so, uh, maybe not quite so rosy. Um, I think 50% of the affordable housing requirement is committed, about 50%. Um, but that is only five years into the plan period. Um, um, so is that such a problem that at five years into the plan period needs to be resolved with more housing allocations now? Um, anybody like to comment on that point? Um, Mr Brown. Not sure if I think it might be a legacy hand. Richard Brown. <coughs> Sorry, sir. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. <coughs> so interesting point. Um, I mean, the council recognised the importance of, of affordable housing, um, recognised as one of their key social issues um, and so on, and recognised in the vision. Um, <coughs> what is apparent from looking at it, <coughs> sorry, is that um, in, the, in the 10 years since the start of the Mid-Suffolk Strategy Review, <coughs> sorry, in 2012, net affordable housing delivery represented just 14% of overall housing delivery, equating to just 229 affordable dwellings per annum. And, and clearly, sir, that that compares poorly with the prevailing 35% <coughs> sorry policy expectation co contained in the adopted policy H4. Um, when you look at the comparative uh, analysis undertaken against affordable housing needs that are identified in the 2012 Schmar, uh, a shortfall of 1,650 <coughs> net affordable dwellings, that shortfall has arisen. Uh, in the 10 year period since 2011-12. Now, <clears throat> the, this council adopt the stance that their housing requirement is met uh, or almost met from uh, commitments. <clears throat> but, but sir, I'm, I'm not aware that you have any evidence as to how and to what extent these so-called commitments deliver affordable housing, uh, how much uh, and of what type. I mean, even even if resolutions to grant planning, uh, 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 planning permission are, are unlikely to be revisited, uh, even if they do not address the affordable housing need identified in the local plan, part one, uh, small small windfall windfall sites, for example, <coughs> um, may, may not um, uh, may not provide any any affordable uh, housing at all. It seems to me that in the absence of specific housing allocations, there is no certainty over the ability to deliver on the affordable housing needs of the district. The residual housing requirement uh, may come for, that may come forward will not make up the affordable housing need. But, but the bit that I'm confused about there, Mr. Brown, is the, the, the figures that I've just uh uh described in my sort of introduction to this question um which is the council's published figures which are on their website and uh, you, you know i don't know whether you've had a chance to look at them and the, the, there are quite a lot of them but there is a summary uh sort of sh sheet but that shows that in taking mid suffolk uh, for a start that more than 20 percent more than the plan period uh, affordable housing requirement, that's the affordable housing requirement from the Schmar, more than 20% more than the plan period has already been um, committed and that 75% of that has been completed, that's completed, that's houses actually built. So five years into the plan, and I'm just, uh, I'm just looking at Mr Deacon because I just want to, he was nodding before and then he stopped nodding, he is nodding, that's all right because I, I just want to make sure I have got the, my, 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 <laughs> Uh, calculations correct, I have, um, that 75% of the plan period housing requirement for uh, affordable housing requirement for um, 
uh, mid Suffolk has already been built, not just commitments already actually built. So I, I don't under, I don't understand how that fits with your figures, um, which I think maybe that's from the past, but but now this is this is where we are now. Um, I don't know where. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, just in connection with the housing requirements, uh, it, it obviously relates to affordable, and it's also my point, sir, that uh, uh, we're not just dealing with affordable housing. Um, I will come back to it later, but we are dealing with uh, re re retirement or care. But, but sir, I, I accept your um, summary figures. Mr. Barber, I think you. Uh, no, yes, ah. thanks. I, I, the, uh, my connection broke just a second there. Um, thank you, sir. Just just a very quick point, not not in terms of Miss Suffolk, but in terms of Baber. Um, I mean, you, you make the point that uh, they've identified a supply of, well, it's actually just less than 50%, um, uh, five years into the plan, but that's still a significant figure. Uh, and uh, that that is based on all of the commitments. Uh, and surely then, if uh, given the number of dwellings that they need to find, um, they would not meet the 100% of the affordable housing target. Ah, right. So, yeah, so... Your argument here that with 80% of the overall housing requirement committed in Baber, around 80%, only 50% of the affordable housing. I think that's your point, isn't it? So, Is it, so yeah. if, yeah, okay. The, the, the other 20% isn't going to provide the remaining 50%. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, looking to the council, if, if you got a comment on that, and uh, I, I, well, yeah, Mr. Deacon. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think obviously we, we've acknowledged the age of some of these figures already, um, but obviously since that point in time, lots more development has been coming forward and, and I don't necessarily wish to sort of commit to recalculating, uh, you know, lots and lots of figures con consistently. But of course, um, the reality is lots more commitment has come forward. Um, we now have completions again for updated years that they wouldn't wouldn't have already been accounted for in the in the tables that you have. Um, so I, I think I'd be very confident in saying that, you know, through the additional growth that has come forward and that will come forward, uh, hopefully with the plans adoption, um, you know, we will certainly be able to meet the meet the needs of that plan. And we have a part two mechanism that can revisit that if necessary. Um, should the uh, well, should should flexibility need to be made through allocations in order to provide uh, additional affordable housing, or or for any other reason? Okay, are you able to comment on the difference between Mid Suffolk and Baber is quite significant in terms of performance since the beginning of the plan period. Are you able to comment on on that? What what why it, it, why is Mid Suffolk got uh, so much more affordable housing than Baber has? Or do you? I probably can't offer you any specific explanation other than it's proportionate to the amount of growth that has been approved um, or sorry committed, not necessarily approved, um, but proportionately there is a there is a substantial substantially greater figure in the mid suffolk area which will inevitably lead to um a higher proportion of relatively similar target levels um and and as i mentioned since since those since that table was produced and, and that that data is there there ha there is actually a significant application that i, I think is referred to in our um officers comments document that was submitted to you recently inspectors um, for the granting of 750 dwellings uh, to which 262 are actually affordable houses so that that would dramatically increase the approximately 50 percent figure in Baber up to something substantially higher um, I don't have the don't have the actual figure recalculated on me but um, 262 is a significant 
increase in the supply of affordable housing. Yeah, I'm just looking, trying to remind myself what the actual requirement figure is uh, for Baber, which is 2,096. So it's about 12% of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, OK, uh, Turley Cambridge MTR. I uh, enjoyed saying that. Um, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I think and just picking up on the point there really that you just mentioned is is the concern we have here and we've been raising since the, the Reg 18 stage is actually that the figures quoted within the affordable housing policy and the requirement figures there don't seem to align with the council's own evidence base in that in quite simple terms the partial update in January 2019 actually identifies a higher affordable housing need in both districts. Um, I believe uh, it is 2,179 in Baber and 2,523 in Mid Suffolk, um, which is leading to a shortfall, a further shortfall, um, which we feel hasn't been addressed or answered by the council in any of the, the documentation that they've provided um, and therefore is only going to exacerbate further the how the affordable housing situation and and I think picking up obviously on what Mr Barber said as well is that yes we're only five years into the plan period at the moment but there is considerable concern around Baber and the, the remaining years of the plan um, can that figure can that figure for affordable housing be picked up as we move through the plan. Um, so there's still some quite large questions we have there concerning specifically the affordable housing. OK, thank you. And Mr Martin Edwards. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think one of the concerns uh, that, that we uh, we had is uh, in relation to uh, information being available uh, and, and up to date. I think one of the key uh, elements of this particular question was uh, in relation to table three uh, and in relation to uh, to the figures that are provided there. Uh, as Mr Deakin said, that's a, a good reflection of the current position as it is uh, at the moment. However, uh, one has to see if this can be uh, updated as we go through uh, the, the, the plan process. And I think to be quite honest, sir, this this relates to many uh, of the other questions that we've already heard uh, this morning. There seems to be a very good commitment uh, on behalf of the, uh, the local authority to bring forward uh, part two. Uh, and there's lots of other evidence apparently that's already underway. Uh, and we have a, a good, healthy land supply and all of these different elements. But what if there was to be a change in circumstance uh, and some of these commitments were not brought forward? How, what would be the sort of mechanism for uh, for allowing us uh, to to see uh, this sort of change in circumstance? Because we are at, at a point X in time here in in June of 2023. The plan period is a lot longer than that, as we all know. Uh, and I, I suppose a, a question for for you, so later on, perhaps uh, during the course of today, is would a would a review mechanism uh, of the plan, an early review, be something that you would consider? Thank you. OK, um, I mean, that that's usually gone into the second part of this question, which is uh, looking at um, wh whether or not existing commitments or, or what if some of the existing commitments of all housing provision uh, aren't actually um, developed. I mean, again, looking at, I, I suppose, you know, uh, a number of representatives have, uh, have made that uh, point. Looking at the figures, again, at about five years into the 20 year plan period, um, the total commitment is about 75 percent in uh, Baber of the full, of the plan period housing needs and about 95 percent in uh, mid, mid uh, Suffolk. And these figures are from uh, well over about, uh, 18 months ago, probably realistically, aren't they? So there will be more commitments since since then. Um, Given those figures, 75% and 95% of the plan period housing requirement already uh, committed, if some of those sites didn't come forward, isn't there still plenty of time in a review either? Well, 
either the part two plan or the statutory five year review of this plan or whatever, isn't there plenty of time uh, to address that? Um, it, does it d does the do the allocations need to be done now? Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Martin Edwards. Thank you. Just just to come back on that. So if you could tell us perhaps when the part two is coming forward, uh, that would be fantastic, because I think that is ultimately one of the questions you asked one of the questions. a moment yeah. ago. Thank you. Yeah. OK, well, well let me just uh, put one more question to you then, Mr. Uh, Mr. Martin Edwards, is if the part two plan didn't ever come, um, but uh, it will in the in the time scale uh, the council envisaged, um, and so you were reliant on the uh, five year uh, statutory review uh, of the of uh, of the plan in five years time, would, would would there be likely to be a problem given the figures that that, that there are with with. 75% and 95% of houses already committed is it, it you know at five years time we get halfway into the plan period and you've got you know the vast majority of the housing required requirement already committed isn't there plenty of time still to resolve that if if, if some of that housing doesn't come forward I, I think the answer is yes, there is. Uh, but if there is a, an early review mechanism, if there is a, a guarantee of when we know that a part two is going to be coming forward, if there are further call for sites, all of these different things that uh, unfortunately we don't seem to have any commitments from the local authority on at the present time, I would definitely concur with you on that one. However, uh, at this current time, we don't have that uh, commitment. Uh, we're looking at a, a plan period to 2037. Uh, it seems crossing our fingers that we've got enough housing, but is is that uh, is that sufficient and is that good enough? And is it good enough to make a, a, a plan found sound at this current time? We would we would question that. And, uh, and apologies because that does go into uh, your your question uh, question one uh, a, a little later on. But I think that the, the the point of these questions that you're you're uh, you're leading on uh, this morning, so they're all intrinsically linked, as as I would suggest. Thank you. Okay. Um... Adil uh, Vladon. Yeah, thank you. Um, the answer to your question is I think, yes, there is plenty of time. Uh, we've heard from the council today that they are committed to bringing forward the part two. There are made neighbourhood plans, as I, I like to reiterate time and time again, that have site allocations in them that are bringing forward houses. Um, just, just a voice from a non-developer non-landowner here just to say there is plenty of time um the we would like part two to be done properly and not rushed therefore if mid suffolk and baber are already starting working on it brilliant um there is that the, the sites are there they are committed we in both thorndon and stradbroke the sites are coming forward we've got um them starting we've got them getting outline permission coming forward for reserve matters so i can't see any there's nothing that's stopping them coming forward so i i, I don't see that there's a problem so the answer to your previous questions is yes there is plenty of time okay thank you and uh, mr ward uh, I just want to add to that, really, because I think there is uh, an understandable bias uh, in the discussion around uh, owner developer interests. Uh, so um, I think well, it's. A, I don't, I don't, to be fair, I don't think there's a bias. It's just the, the people who are here. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. Should I say preponderance? Preponderance of voices from a certain perspective, put it that way. Um, yes, I wasn't implying any bias, but I just think, you know, you're, you're, I'm sure you're aware your figures, I think, slightly understate the extent to which Baber's um, uh, requirement is already met. I mean, the 750 at Wolsey Gate uh, isn't included in the 1191 residual housing requirement. So you're down to 400 uh, and Mid Suffolk is already met. Now, I'm sure those, you know, there are people around the table that would like that requirement to be far greater. But as far as communities and particularly communities in the Ipswich fringe, who have really, uh, in terms of the, the, I think we're now in the thousands of new homes that are in that com committed supply uh, pipeline. Um, you know, another 750 at, uh, at Sporton, you know, the, the need is already there. We're, we're up to seven years uh, uh, housing supply now, more than five. You know, we simply don't need these homes. There's a separate argument I know about the extent around affordable housing. Um, but, you know, the neighbourhood planning process allows for a bottom up approach in terms of giving communities a voice over where they feel um, uh, development can be 
uh, there is the capacity for that. Uh, and therefore, absolutely yes um, to your question. OK, thank you. And Turley. Thank you, sir. I think what I just want to reiterate here on, on our behalf is that it's not necessarily that we're advocating for allocations within the part one plan. It's about getting this housing requirement right. And I think in regard to the second part of this question, it isn't unreasonable to expect a degree of flexibility within that housing requirement, be it 5%, be it 20%, as previously tested in the SA. So um, that is, is our point in respect to this question is that it, it's a require it, it's a need to get this housing requirement right at this stage yes the, the the supply may be made up in the future but we don't know that at this stage and it's perfectly reasonable and plenty of other examples of local plans where there is a percentage of flexibility um built into the requirement which we don't necessarily see um in in this one here right okay it, just on that point the the need for a buffer, I think, is referred to, um, well, several places. Uh, I think the council will probably remind me better, but certainly I think in the trajectory, um, uh, maybe it doesn't mention it in the uh, trajectory. Um, I'm, it was, hmm. it, I think it is. It, Sorry, sir. You carry on. It does refer to it. it maybe it's uh, maybe it's um, near table three. Um, I'm, I'm, ah, Mr. Deacon, you're coming in to uh, remind yes. me. Where, where does uh, it say? Thank you, it? Inspectors. I, I think in the submitted plan, uh, if you remember, we did have uh, a, a supply figure that was a 20 percent, effectively a 20 percent buffer from the housing requirement. Um, I don't believe we, we we haven't talked about buffers right now. What we have said is that in the part two document, uh, the need for a buffer to provide flexibility, et cetera, et cetera, will be a key part of that analysis. Yeah, that's that that's what I was meaning. But where does it say that? Um, can you remind me where it? Uh, uh, none of us can remember. Is it what 108 maybe? No, um, it does definitely say it somewhere. Um, um, oh. I think we'd certainly oh. say it, but a buffer, a buffer would be desirable. Uh, and we've said that in our, our recent comments to you inspectors in, in uh, our officer's summary notes. No, but um, it, does, it says it in the plan somewhere, does it? It says it in the plan as proposed to be modified. Just I am aware, about. as you say, sir, that it, there was a paragraph deleted 6.07 where there was reference to it. I'm not entirely convinced that it reappeared as a percentage elsewhere in the modification, but I may be I may Wrong. be incorrect in saying that. Um, but OK, well, I'll... Yeah, the, the, it, again, it, the point is it's all pushing it to the part two and um, without yeah. any significant commitment that we know that that is coming forward. Um, there is a view that there should be something built into the housing requirement under SP01 um, and the part one plan. OK, right. Thanks. All right. Thank um, you. Uh, I'll come uh, to Mr. Bedford at the end. Uh, a deal. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I keep hearing people saying there's been no commitment to part two and I've heard nothing but commitment to part two. So I just thought I'd say that I am listening and I have heard the council say that they have actually started commissioning the work and I've ha heard uh, a councillor say that they're very pro having a part two. So I, I, I'm just a bit confused why people keep saying they haven't heard any commitment to it. What? I, I've heard what I've heard, so we, we could go on with that one uh, forever and ever. So thank you, but um, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll leave that particular point for the moment. Thanks, um, Chris Ullman. Uh, I just wanted to say, from the point of view of the Hadley neighbourhood plan, which isn't yet complete, certainly we would not want any more allocations at this stage because. There are some proposed allocations within that plan, uh, but of course, uh, until that plan is made, they won't be effective. OK, thank you. Um, Mr. Deak, uh, well, Mr. Bedford. Or Mr. Deacon, whoever wants to go first, really, I don't mind. <laughs> so, so I was only going to make uh, hopefully a, 
a fairly narrow point, and then Mr. Deakin can add. It was just going back to the suggestion that, um, as it were, this part one plan should have within it a commitment to an early review. Um, so I think we would see that as um, undesirable for this reason, that it will simply duplicate the process that's already being envisaged um, in that what we've got um, as it proposed to be um, modified is a part one plan and a part two plan. And the council, through those comments you've just heard, is clearly committed to the part two plan. And that will itself provide what would uh, be a, an opportunity to review the housing requirement figure as well as uh, the housing provision figures that will meet the requirement. So um, we shouldn't be, uh, as it were, uh, diverting efforts from producing the part two plan by a commitment to an early review of the part one plan because they'll be effectively doing the same job. The backstop, of course, as you've already indicated, sir, is that the part one plan will have its own legal requirement for a review uh, at the five year point. So th there's no question that there will be a review of the part one plan in due course, but it would rather, I say, dilute energies and, and duplicate efforts to saddle the council with both having to do an early review of the part one plan at the same time that it's trying to make progress with the part two plan. And given the split between part one and part two, we would say the priority should be on getting the part two plan up and running and then in place uh, as soon as practicable. OK, thank you, uh, Mr Deakin. Thank you. Um, it was just to offer some help on the buffer situation, if, if we want to sort of clarify that. Um, searching through the um, the track change document, there is only one mention of the word buffer, uh, and indeed it's in strikeout text. So it's page 29 of the um, track change document, if that's helpful, and that was in the context of the spatial distribution narrative uh, that's been removed. So um, I think the only area of the plan that really kind of alludes uh, to those type of issues coming up is in the part two description, which is paragraph 0108. In the meantime, I have found it because it does it doesn't use the word buffer. Um, it is that I thought it was the housing trajectory. It is the housing trajectory. It's the second paragraph uh, before the housing trajectory table where it says the performance of the new housing delivery will be carefully tracked through the proposal set out in the monitoring framework within this plan. A part two joint local plan document and associated policy maps alterations will review for new I think there's a typo in there that we need to address, but anyway, <laughs> we'll review for new housing allocations. Uh, I think it should say we'll review the need for new housing uh, allocations um, insofar as are necessary to provide flexibility and ensure that the plan period housing requirement can be met. So I knew there was a reference in there some way. It's not buffer, it says flexibility. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think we're saying that's consistent with uh, paragraph 0108 effectively. When we yeah. get to the part two document, that will certainly be a key part of um, reviewing what you know what needs to be done at that point. Yeah, and I think there is a missing, there is a typo in there. there I think it should say we'll review the need for, shouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Like that. Okay, uh, Mr. Stringer. Oh, sorry, Councillor Stringer. Sorry. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, the, just wanted to point out something that probably won't help you. That will possibly confuse you more so apologies but the the housing delivery trade as it were is changing some of the allocations already being built out in terms of their percentage of affordables we are witnessing here sites upping the amount of affordables on them on already approved applications for commercial reasons because the commercial housing market at the moment is I think turbulent uh, to be uh, uh, accurate uh, and we've already seen one site locally here converting to 100% affordable for those commercial reasons that won't help you in your deliberations but I think it's only uh, only right to point that out okay uh, thank you uh, for that right I think that probably then covers um, question four or point four so let's move on to uh, point 
five, which is policy SPO three, as is proposed to be modified. And just a number of points um, on um, that. Um, so uh, there's a number of arguments that it's uh, the policies too restrictive of housing outside um, settlement um, boundaries. Um, I suppose my question is to people who've argued uh, that point, if you and I think a number of people have said, well, uh, it should allow for housing um, that's you know immediately uh, agreeing uh, settlement boundaries. Um, wouldn't, well, wouldn't that have the potential to um, lead to large numbers of housing, or, um, you know, outside or next to the settlements of some next to the settlement boundaries of some very small settlements, um, you know, in an uncontrolled uh, way, um, which might not be terribly sustainable at all? Um, anybody want to comment on that? Mr. Lawson. Uh, you're on you're on mute. Yeah, so I think our, our key point is that there is a clear conflict uh, with the policy wording at present with uh, policies in neighbourhood plans, which, which provide for uh, that include criterion uh, to, to provide for housing on the edge of settlements, which, of course, it can be entirely appropriate, uh, bearing in mind that uh, I, I think I'm right in saying that um, the settlement boundaries haven't been reviewed for uh, at least not a full review for, for about 25 years or so. And, and therefore, uh, they don't actually um, provide uh, a, a sound basis for for settlement pattern on the ground. And, and this is an area that, that you know, has drawn the criticism of um, uh, appeal inspectors who, who have obviously allowed schemes, even some quite large schemes actually, uh, on the basis that um, the built up area boundary principles, uh, the council's own principles, uh, are not actually being implemented. So uh, in terms of the the, the fear of uh, uh, unplanned development, I, I, I think all, all I would say is, is draw you to your attention to uh, policy CS11 of the core strategy, but also but it is, is, is also reflected in a number of neighbourhood plans, including Watfield, um, that, that uh, as long as you've got a, a, a good set of criteria that, that, um, that recognise the, uh, you know, the site's characteristics, you know, its landscape value, uh, hedgerows, ecology, et cetera, uh, and obviously heritage assets or what have you, uh, then it, it's uh, certainly in order to, to provide for limited development on the edge of villages, as long as you're meeting all those criteria. OK, thank you. You um, you've sort of anticipated the third part of this question, um, which deals with that uh, point. Um, I mean, I thought uh, when, when I read your point, I thought that was a uh, it, it was a sensible point um, and valid. Um, so. My suggestion to address that would be to change part two of SPO3 um, instead of saying um, uh, that development would be only allowed outside settlement boundaries where it was uh, uh, allocated uh, for development in a na in, in a made neighbourhood plan uh, to change it to say uh, for development was in accordance with a made neighbourhood plan. So that's both allocations and any policy that allows for development. And I think uh, I think from your note, you council used. Uh, I think you say you're be content with that. Is, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. So I think hopefully, I mean, Mr. Lawson, does that does that address does that change in wording address that concern of yours, that specific concern? It certainly does, sir. And I, I, you know, I, I think that that could potentially be the wording we'd um, proposed. So yes, uh, we would concur with that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Bedford. Uh, 
Thank you, sir. So, uh, simply to say, it's a, it'd be a matter for you, but if you make that change, whether for consistency, you might want to look also at um, SPO3 item one, just to make sure the two are running together, insofar as they're making that point about neighbourhood plans. Yes, yeah, so I suppose it's um, it, 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 it's windfall development. It says in accordance with the relevant policies of the plan. If it said of the development plan, that would include the. Well, that would I, include I, I, I was thinking of slightly the words just before that. All right. Uh, because it, because it does there refer to allocations in made neighbourhood plans. But I think you were saying in accordance with made neighbourhood plans. Yeah, because, because I, in a, as, 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 well, if, perhaps uh, if I try and explain my point and then you can tell me why it's wrong, I, I'd read one and two, as it were, as the two sides of the coin. One was saying how the provision was expected to be made. Uh, and then two was saying, um, well, outside of settlement boundaries, you shan't have development unless and then there are a series of exceptions. Yeah. Uh, and it it just seemed that um, so far as um, two is concerned, and I say we don't have a problem with that, and we've said that I think in our um, hearing um, statement um, that deals with the main issues. Uh, but it was just that then we wouldn't want to see, I think, an inconsistency between one and two that people could, as it were, argue created a problem. So it just seemed that if one was going to say that uh, new housing development will come forward and it will be through a list of things if there are made neighborhood plans which allow for development outside of boundaries other than by allocations that should also be reflected in one that's all i was trying to say yeah no i i, I, I agree entirely but i think my point was that isn't it, it, it that would be windfall wouldn't it that would be windfall development um, well, that, because that, that, it, that slightly begs, I mean, I have to say, I don't know how those neighbourhood plans have formulated those policies as to whether one would say that there inevitably would be windfall development. I can I can see they may well be, and you may well say, well, um, it's, it's, it's a policy which uh, allows for development outside of the neighbourhood plan, but it doesn't allocate the site, therefore it should be regarded as windfall. I, I was just saying, I, I don't know, because I don't know, I'm not familiar with the content of the neighbourhood neighbourhood plans. OK, let's can I ask the council? I mean, I think we've, we're all agreed on the point that one yeah. needs to be changed as well. Uh, if I could ask can, the council to have a look at the wording of that and come uh, back to us with uh, some wording that you think yeah. um, would match that up with the wording that I've suggested for part two um, and do that. So whether it's either under talking about, you know, um, allocations and policies in neighbourhood plans or whether it is windfall, I don't know, but we can. Um, yeah talk about that okay right um okay oh, mr lawson uh, yeah, yeah thank you sir um i just wanted to make the point that um and i generally concur with everything that's been said is that um uh, mr bedford's um uh, sort of seeking clarification um that there are a number of neighborhood plans that do allocate sites however there are a number of neighborhood plans that uh, don't allocate uh, there's also um, no housing requirement has been set, unfortunately, by, by the local plan for a number of neighbourhood plans that, that have a clear need for development. And uh, those neighbourhood plans have, have sort of addressed the situation, I think, quite uh, prudently by setting out uh, criteria based policies, but, but using their own housing evidence, if you like, to determine the, the level of, of housing that may be required rather than a specific um, ceiling. OK, um, thank you uh, for that. Um, use of the word normally, this was a point made by um, Sproughton Parish Council, who I don't think are uh, here. I doubt anybody else has got um, concerns, well, certainly from the developer side, I'm, I'm sure you haven't got concerns with the, the word normally, uh, as opposed to you know, like taking it out altogether, the word normally. Um, no, nobody's got their hand up. So we'll move on from uh, that. Uh, the third part of uh, SPO3 question part five, we've just 
um, dealt with, well, uh, agenda item five, the third bullet point of that we've just dealt with. Um, um, yeah, then the fourth point concerns whether or not it's uh, necessary for part two of the policy to specifically refer to the other policies um, that uh, other policies of the plan um, that would enable development um, outside settlement boundaries. Um, I mean, Mike, uh, I think the specific reference was made to has been made in representations to LPO7, but there are a number of others. Um, so my concern with doing that would be that, well, if you're going to mention one, then you've got to mention them all. And then do you run the risk of missing some out um, and it just becomes long and confusing? Is is it not just clear that if there is another policy in the plan uh, that allows for development outside settlement settlement limits that this policy SPO3 isn't standing in the way of that. Um, I think that was it was Pigeon that made that point. I don't know whether um, Turley's isn't it? I don't know whether you wanted to comment on that at all. No, that's. Oh. Sorry, sir. I don't know. We were just just looking at each other. I'm not entirely sure in respect to this. We did raise that point. Oh right. <laughs> we were oh, right. looking a little blank on that one. <laughs> Oh right, fair enough. Maybe I've got got uh yeah. Somebody raised that point, but they clearly that that's that's fine. There doesn't seem to be anybody who really wants to discuss it, so that's that's uh that's fine. Um and then the final point on this was uh which sort of comes back to the the, the whole uh the, 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 sort of the heart of the discussion that we're having was the concern about part three of uh, policy SPO3 that says settlement boundaries will be reviewed and if necessary um, revised. Um, I mean the, the reason uh, uh, and I remember uh, saying to the council or suggesting this wording to the council um, the reason it says if necessary revised is it's distinguishing between review which is part two plan will have to review the boundaries look at them um but whether they need to be revised you just can't say at the moment now it seems to me quite likely that they will have to be revised but to say you have to revise something um uh seems to be taking you know who knows what the circumstances are going to be like there so that was the reason for that wording um but it is a, a definite clear requirement that it would have to be or a statement that it would have to be reviewed uh, the, uh, the settlement boundaries um does anybody want to come back on that point i think the people who said that aren't here either no um ah uh mr lawson again Thank you, sir. I, I, I just think that um, and we hadn't actually specifically made this point, but so I'm just with you on the, um, you know, on, on, on the review of it. Uh, I, I think the we would feel there's a bit of a, a presumption against uh, revising if you have it necessary. Um, maybe if, if appropriate, I think would be our preferred wording. Uh, yeah. Uh, Council, do you have a a thought on appropriate versus necessary. I I, I think it's there's probably it's much much of a muchness <laughs> between them. You you wouldn't do it if it wasn't appropriate to do so. I mean, for for example, some of the neighbourhood plans have looked recently at uh, settlement boundaries and they've, as it were, carried out a coherent package uh, uh, of. Um, revision and you know, I don't think we would be wanting to interfere with that if there wasn't some uh, justification for doing so whether you call that a need to do so or whether you call that appropriate to do so probably doesn't matter a great deal uh, I think we think it's clear enough as it is but I don't think we would go to the wall as it were if you thought appropriate was a better word okay um I'll have a think about that one as to um as to yeah i mean because i think they do broadly mean the same thing but there is that i take mr lawson's point that particularly given the general concern uh, over this broad issue that we, we we need to make the word the right so well i'll give some consideration um 
to that one. OK, um, I think that then deals with question five. Does anybody else got their hands up? Um, what I suggest we do um, is hopefully uh, get through six and seven and then we'll take a, a break. Six and seven hopefully um, shouldn't um, take too um, long. Um, question six concerns paragraph 0801, which is the supporting text for SPO3 that we've just been um, talking about. You'd see in the agenda I've suggested some um, uh, some slightly altered wording um, to this paragraph, taking account of the comments uh, that have been made. Um, I think the, the, to refer to um, uh, that the um, that the that the settlement boundaries, uh, well, that that the how the, the current housing um, uh, supply would mean that. Uh, the settlement boundaries wouldn't need to be uh, altered in the short to medium term to say that rather than uh, pending the adoption of the part two plan. The reason for that is, as you've said, the part two plan, you know, whatever the council say, the part two plan uh, might never appear. Um, and then therefore it's appropriate uh, to say that the boundaries uh, are suitable for the short to medium term. So I'm imagining that nobody's got a huge problem with that. Um, and also to revise it to say uh, that it is likely uh, that uh, the development needs were met rather than they will be because you can't guarantee uh, that development needs would be met. So I'm presuming that most people would be um, either content or pleased with um, that revision to the wording. Does anybody have any comments on that? No. OK, and uh, I think the council, you said you were OK with it, didn't you? Yeah. OK, um, and then table um, seven then. Um, and this question was, should this be amended to make clear that housing allocations in the part two plan will need to reflect the housing requirement figure and the desire of being uh, desirability of there being some flexibility in supply? Which goes back to the discussion we've just um, had. And I did think that the argument that a number of people have raised is that it does make a reasonable point that the paragraph on the at the beginning of the trajectory, or certainly the second paragraph before the uh, trajectory, where it talks about ensuring that uh, housing needs are met, taking account of flexibility, that it would be appropriate for that same wording to appear at table um, three. Um, would the council have any problem with that? I'm presuming not, since it's the same wording. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, it, it is fully the intention to um, to look at these matters in due course. So, yeah, there's no no concerns. Yeah, so that's what I would uh, suggest that that same wording uh, as the trajectory is added into table three. Right. Well, not actually in the table itself, but you know, the the, the notes below the table. Okay. Um, no comments on uh, that then. OK, um, we'll take, um, we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes nearly, so we'll take uh, a short break and we'll return at uh, 10 to 12, if that's OK. OK, thanks.
um welcome back um if we move on to uh um question eight which relates to uh the settlement boundaries um and whether or not it is feasible to uh amend those that are proposed to include either or uh, uh, completed housing developments and um all uh commitments um and just as a background to i suppose this is that uh when we wrote to the council you know back in the autumn of 2020 uh one and set out this suggested approach um it did go through our mind that thought we gave quite a bit of thought at that stage to whether it was possible to take account of um completed housing developments and uh, uh, other commitments. Um, and we reached the view that it, 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 it's a moment in time, um, what is uh, a, a, a you know completed development and half of sites are developed and the other half aren't and all sorts of things like this. And it's just, uh, uh, we, we, it, it just becomes so difficult um, to allocate things that but um, of to, to show us uh, within settlement boundaries um, things that might be half completed or some commitments that might never come forward and all this sort of thing. And that actually um, the easiest thing, and uh, although the only really practical thing we thought was to um, just leave the uh, settlement boundaries as they are now unchanged, other than uh, where updated already anyway by neighbourhood uh, plans which have already automatically updated the policies map. So that was that was the uh, thinking then. Um, number of people in response to the um, consultation, I'm not particularly surprised, have said it that, you know, well, can't you add uh, completions or um, uh, why not all commitments? Um, in the light of that introduction, are there any comments, anything that people want to say on that? Any reason why how it might be feasible um, uh, to deal with to deal with this? Um, start with uh, the Gladman House Meeting Room. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, in terms of is it feasible and practical to do this? I, for the, some of the reasons you mentioned there, um, I agree that it presents some serious difficulties. Um, but one of the issues that it does present to the council is when when this when this plan, if the plan is adopted in its current form, it will then sort of enliven, if you like, the settlement boundaries as they are. They would um, it would restrict development outside settlement boundaries in in effect, and therefore the council in its supply documents to you has a series of sites that are outside settlement boundaries, um, and they're listed in um, H forty three. There's there is sites. Um, with resolution to grant subject to 106, and this applies to both across both authorities. If that site is now outside the settlement boundary, this plan is adopted. Those sites without a planning commission, sorry, without the, have a resolution to grant subject to section 106, would then be contrary to that plan, and therefore um, should be taken back to committee and refused because they would be in contrary. They'd be contrary to the up, the up to date development plan. So those elements in the supply couldn't be relied upon. Right, I see. So, the, yeah. So, you're meaning not uh, that this is this is not sites that have got planning permission or, or outline permission, even because either full or outline permission, because they, there, the principle of development has been deemed acceptable. But ones that have got resolution to grant. Um, okay, what's the council's thoughts on that? So uh, I think uh, in the first instance, clearly uh, going back to where we were back in uh, 2021, uh, it was quite clear uh, that uh, you and um, your fellow inspector, Ms. Partington, were not content uh, with the approach of uh, endorsing, uh, as it were, commitments that the council had identified which consisted of existing planning permissions or resolutions to grant because 
uh, you were not sufficiently persuaded that they made uh, a coherent spatial strategy and, and, and so on. Now, clearly, the council has accepted in a sense, the position that you've reached on that. And we've um, therefore uh, formulated uh, main modifications that go with the grain of, of this way, the way that your thinking is going. Um, and we're not in a sense, trying to resile from that. Um, but it would be, we would think, somewhat, somewhat inconsistent with accepting that concern to then, as it were, through the back door, bring in uh, sites which were the subject of that concern by formalising them and recognising them in the plan. Because I say it seems to go underneath or behind the concern that's been expressed. Now, obviously, so far as the actual planning permissions are concerned, uh, in a sense, it's neither here nor there, because if the pl planning permission exists and it's implemented, it doesn't need this plan to say anything about it. The only thing uh, that it would say in terms of planning permissions would be if that planning permission isn't implemented. So far as the uh, sites which have got a resolution to grant is concerned, they will be subject to their own, as it were, administrative procedures. It, it's not um, right, uh, I think, uh, to suggest to you, as I think Mr Carville did, that they would have to go back to committee. Uh, there is a whole um, series of um, case law on the circumstances in which a planning authority needs to return an application to committee if there's been a material change of circumstance since it was considered by committee but before the actual grant of permission. And it's certainly not the case that it's an inevitability. It's a very much a case specific judgment as to whether the circumstances justify it going back to committee and whether as a matter of um, administrative law, there's a requirement to do that or it's a matter of discretion and so on and so forth. But in a sense, all of that is in a sense, nothing to do with your concern it, the council will have to obviously act lawfully in deciding what it does do with any of those pending applications, depending on the circumstances at the time that the 106 is ready to be sealed and so on and so forth. But I go back to my beginning point that it, it shouldn't be through the back door that one brings into the plan sites that you and your colleague had concerned about at the outset. So that's that's the take I would take on that. Yeah. So in, in summary, in relation to Gladman's point, you're saying, well, they might get, you know, a, a particular scheme that's got a resolution to grant might get uh, might get approved or it might not. That would all be down to discussion at the time. But but the, the, the plan, yeah, doesn't really get involved with that as such. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, Mr Deacon. Um, yes, thank you. It's just as a follow up to that. I mean, if, if we're talking about sites with subjects, uh, sites with resolution to grant subject to 106, from the data that we have provided, that amounts to a total of around 600 dwellings, which um, is approximately three to four percent of the commit total committed supply. So it's a relatively small percentage of sites anyway. Yeah, inevitably of concern to those people who've got a, <laughs> a, a resolution to grant. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. OK. OK. Um, any other? Uh, Mr. Ullman. Is it working? Oh, yes. Um, yes, I suppose the um, in a way, I was saying that because in Hadley, there are a lot of potentially several hundred houses that could be developed uh, outside the existing settlement boundary. It would be better to, for it to reflect the reality. Um, but on the other hand, I can see an argument to say by keeping the existing boundary, at least it uh, makes it more ev evident that these things are outside the current boundary. So I'm a kind of um, half and half on this one now. I, I mean, yeah, I, um, and, and, uh, it, I mean, it's, there's the it, um, perception, I suppose, uh, is a matter of perception. People might look at the settlement boundary and think, oh, things aren't going to be built there unless they're aware of the things that are in the pipeline. Yeah. And in that sense, it's no different to now. The 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 
you know, th those settlement boundaries and the settlement boundaries that exist now, this plan would just not change them. So it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't be any different to the situation now, if you see what I mean. It's not as if this plan this plan was proposing to change the settlement boundaries and now it isn't. Um, so I suppose that's 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 the thing. It's not as if it's changing them to something different uh, to what they uh, to what they are now, which was different from what was in the plan before, if you see what I mean. That makes sense. Um, Mr Lawson. Thank you, sir. Now, I, I think um, again that there's a there's, there's an important point in in terms of inconsistency uh, here with the the local plan and made neighbourhood plans. Uh, insofar as and, and I, I I would say certainly as far as in insofar as Watfield is concerned, that um, that they obviously have very limited resources indeed, and and their their review of the settlement boundary simply. Uh, was, uh, you know, they, they, they were content to reflect that the current local, the, the plan as shown in the Regulation 19 uh, local plan draft, uh, which, as we know, is, was uh, not, not entirely sound. But my, my principal concern is that um, where you've got made neighbourhood plans that, that have a, a clear cut criteria policy, uh, that, that um, obviously allows for and also denies uh, a residential development on the edge of uh, villages. So, so, for example, if, if I may, um, I'm looking at the Watfield plan, and uh, one of the criteria there in, in policy WAT4 is that um, the, uh, the, the site needs to have a close functional relationship to the existing settlement or constitutes a logical extension. Now, if you reflected the the um, uh, commitments in, from my point of view would be uh, planning permissions. So your you, you, you're certainly your relationship to, to a, a boundary that reflects a planning permission is quite different to a relationship to, to a boundary that uh, simply doesn't reflect that because you, you know you might be some distance away. There might be fields in between you or a field or paddock between you and the, and the old boundary. Uh, which is, is is manifestly hugely out of date. So uh, the, it, it means that, um, that sites that may in, in fact comply with a neighbourhood plan policy would would, uh, would would not would fail to comply if if, um, if commitments weren't taken into account. That, that, that's my key key concern, and I, and I do know that officers um, are. <laughs> I choose my words carefully, but you know they are finding it quite challenging to to uh, to to, um, to apply the policies of the, of the adopted local plan and made neighbourhood plans as well. And, and they, they, we don't seem to have quite got to grips with, with some of the neighbourhood plan policies. So that, that, that was my, my my key area, really. OK, thank you. And Adil uh, Ladon. Um, yeah, I, the only comment I would make is if you included commitments, it takes away the urgency for the developer to actually bring the houses forward because then they fall within the settlement boundary. And then um, we 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 fall into a position where they may just land bank and we don't have our five year landing ha housing land supply anymore. Um, you know, completed housing developments are there. They're, they're visible and planning committees can see them um, when they review a planning application. Um, if the mid -suff if mid if the councils have to spend time rewriting the settlement boundaries or revising them, at what point in time do they stop? Do they stop today when 30 of the 60 homes in Stradbroke are being built? Do they wait until next January when 60 or 60 on the site are built? I mean, you know, you, th there comes a point where you have to say, at what you know how much time is it going to take the councils to revise the settlement boundaries when they're bringing forward a part two that I assume will allocate the sites that are required and then change it so it, it seems um I mean I know it's unfortunate for, for neighborhood plans that don't have recognized haven't allocated sites but for those that have it's already been done um and the problem is is if you include some and not others if you include c commitments you're almost taking away that um, urgency for people to develop and the whole point of this is to bring forward houses for people to live in it's not to line developers pockets it's to ensure that the people of mid suffolk and baber have somewhere to live um okay. in, in 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 a time scale that they need them says the mother of four children who are still living at home aged 21 to 27 
OK, um, thank you. Um, uh, Mr Lawson, oh, is, is Legacy hand or did you put your hand up again, Mr Lawson? Just put my hand up again. Oh, yeah. I'll briefly come back. You know, I do appreciate the points being made by uh, you know, the Neighbourhood Plan colleague. However, uh, you know, the, the land market is, is, is very complex. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I do think that the government has been trying to uh, just broaden the uh, the market to allow for smaller builders to come forward with, with fires and tens of 15. So we, we're certainly not talking about land banking. I think what we're talking about is, is people being able to bring forward uh, modest um, parcels of land with, with some certainty, because they're very costly for promoting land, uh, particularly if, um, uh, you know, you're only a five or 10 unit mark. And uh, the, it, it, it's, it, 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 I mean, could I just suggest as um, a, a, a compromise, perhaps, if, if the council don't have resources uh, at this current point in time, um, and, and obviously I hear what uh, Mr Bedford says about back doors and things, I'm not, not quite sure, and maybe we could use a side door and, and, and perhaps review uh, made neighbourhood plans, uh, because they're, they're obviously uh, in, in a part of the development plan, statutory development plan for the area. And at least if, if the planning permissions were, uh, you know, were incorporated in all the made neighbourhood plans, that, that, that would be a start from my, my point of view. Sorry, just so I'm clear, what, what, what quite do you mean there? So, so the made neighbourhood plans that have got a settlement boundary or defined a different settlement boundary from the council, well, that is as shown that they will be included. Um, they will be included in in the policies map. They are there in the policies map now because they're part of the policies map. So those. But was this something different you were talking about? Sorry, Mr. Yeah. Lawson, I didn't quite follow. So what I'm saying is is that um, that, that those those boundaries are there, but they're they're hugely out of date and and they don't uh, incorporate commitments. And and the if a criteria based policy. Ah, right. right. Yeah, so if the criteria based policy requires you to be, you know, well related to the village, right. well related to services, that sort of thing. Um, but the, you know, the paddock's left out because, the, you know, the, 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 the seven boundaries quite frankly in the wrong place. Uh, then, you know, you, as a good site, you could find yourself being, being kept out in the cold because you don't comply with the right. policy. Whereas, in fact, you would. And all I'm saying um, in, in, in trying to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, even handed is is uh, could 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 the council review all the made neighbourhood plans settlement boundaries as part of part one, put the commitments in there, and then at least for those made neighbourhood plans, the, the the implementing and considering sites against those criteria policy would be uh, would be assisted. Right. Okay. Um, can uh, I'll come back to the council for comment on that? But, but, well, uh, Councillor Stringer for the council is uh, wanting to speak, so we'll hear what Ms. Uh, Councillor Stringer has to say. Just from having a small experience of neighbourhood plans, uh, they also have to be reviewed. So there's an uh, you know uh, 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 over time uh, and actually in quite a short space of time if they wish to be up to date and current and have have effect. So basically, it's about getting the timings right in terms of. If you've got a neighbourhood plan that seeks to do this and bring development forward there, nothing surely stops it uh, doing that so long as it's compliant with the MPPF and and the the current development local framework. Uh, I hear what you're saying about if the if the settlement boundary then redefined as it were on that, where does it leave them? Well, it leaves them where they want to be in terms of seeking their aspirations because we will also be coming you know later down the line with 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 new allocations as well which would which would obviously be compliant and in line with that so i i unless you stop the clock for everyone and allow everyone to catch up in time i think you're always going to find these anomalies when you've got different people setting different allocations on different time frames okay um okay thank you uh for oh did you want to come back again mr lawson or Yes, if um, you know, obviously hear what what Councillor Stringer says, and and you know, I, I think that there's a wide variety of native plans out there. There's some that are allocating 100 or 150 units, and the, and there's actually a housing requirements in the plan, but there are a um, an appreciable number uh, that that don't actually allocate, and and the the the, the uh, settlement boundaries is pretty vital. 
And in fact, they, they won't want to allocate because uh, at, at that sort of level, some neighbourhood plans are, you know, feel they're, they're, they're sort of, back, you know, they're signing one land over, over another. And, and some of them expressly prefer to use a criteria based policy. So I, all I'm saying is that um, it, it would seem to me to be unfair for site to be left out that, that actually might have quite a bit uh, going for it in terms of infrastructure provision, affordable housing to be left out simply because uh, a commitment to planning fishing hadn't been shown and, and the line hadn't been taken around it. And I would suggest that the planning application boundary uh, might be the appropriate um, you know, forum for a project. Okay. I mean, just that thought, I mean, it's a difficult one. My thought on that is if 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 there's a existing commitment outside a, a, a neighbourhood plan settlement boundary, um, and that you know it, it, it's a, a a scheme with with planning permission, um, and that neighbourhood plan has got a policy that says you know we'll consider small sites outside the settlement boundary where it's where it's uh, where it's you know cl closely related to the uh, to, to the uh, to the settlement, um, it wouldn't stop the council considering well actually you, you, you know these five or ten houses here they're next to this site that's got planning permission they're outside the settlement boundary but you, you, you know that, that, that the neighborhood plan policy allows for that it wouldn't mean that they would automatically get refused i wouldn't have thought they they could potentially get approved couldn't they because they'd be outside the settlement boundary either way um i mean they could do sir uh, although i must say that you know if you can tend to go to parish council meetings as a promoter uh, you're not generally well received and um the, the settlement boundaries are extremely important uh, to, to the local residents. And uh, I think that the, there's more of a, um, there's more of an equitable approach. Uh, if, if, if everyone understands where the settlement boundary is and where it should be, it, it's, uh, I think it's better all around for decision making uh, than, you know, suggesting, oh, well, that, that's been approved. Uh, why can't we have one next to it? So, you know, I, I think that it's very difficult to, to counter the view that, well, you're outside the settlement boundary, uh, we've already approved it, um, you already approved some. I, I just think if, if there was more clarity over settlement boundaries in terms of truly defining the, the, the built up part of the village, then, then that, would, that would assist decision making. I'm not suggesting everything should be approved, but uh, all I'm saying is if, if the, what, what, what appears to be countryside is in fact part of the settlement, the less likely for, for mistakes to be made, uh, particularly at the neighbour plan and, and village level. OK, um, thank you for that. We've probably taken that as far as uh, we can, I think. Um, let's move on to uh, point nine, the policies map. Just a um, couple of things I just want to clarify with the council on this. So um, Drinkstone Parish Council, who I don't think are here, um, said there was an error. Now, it, it, just so I can clear, um, looking to the council, this is the same error that uh, you'd already noted yourself and put a uh, uh, put a note on the website, is it, or is this a different error? It's the same one. Oh, it's the same one. So that's already that's already dealt with. Um, East Burkholt neighbourhood plan. The green space is not correctly shown, which you accept and you say you will. Uh, change that that's fine that's correct yeah yeah and then East Burkholt also said that um, the extent of the proposal to extend or the, the the proposal to extend the conservation area isn't shown just so I understand this I'm presuming that proposal to extend the conservation area well it's a proposal it's not in a made neighborhood plan so it wouldn't be appropriate to show it but if they revise update the neighborhood plan and there's a new made neighborhood plan with that then then the policies map would be changed at that point that's right that, yeah it's still a proposal yeah. so that's why it doesn't appear yet but um yeah. yes as and when we get to that point it will be recognized right okay uh that's all very clear um oh uh turley don't know whether this is settlement boundaries or policies map but it, anyway <laughs> Sorry, sir. Yes, you moved on um, quite quickly and I was going to ask a, a, a point about uh, question eight. Is it OK to go back to that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Is that all right? Yeah, it was that's just fine. A suggest 
Thank you. It was just a suggestion, really. Um, so appreciate everyone. Uh, previously, the conversation was around the commitments and, and the neighbourhood plans. But the point that we were possibly coming from um, and as a suggestion, because we thought it was quite feasible, was to have a look at the settlement boundaries in respect to the saved policies. So, for example, Chiltern Woods. Um, and looking at extending the settlement boundaries around those historic allocations, which are coming forward through this local plan as well, to give some certainty um, that they are that they are within the settlement boundary coming forward. Quite a few of them have got quite um, long uh, outline consent periods, and for clarity purposes, we wanted to make the suggestion that as a commitment, it might be quite a simple task to look at extending the settlement boundaries around those specific site allocations. Again, trying to be helpful to the council and, and just trying to bring that all together. OK, so these are allocate the Chilton, is it the Chilton Wood site you mentioned there? That's an allocation of the, if you can remind me which plan was it? It's, it's, Sorry? A core it's a core strategy allocation so, that's being saved. So, yeah, that's what I thought. Isn't that all? I'm looking to the council here. Isn't that that's all it should already be in, isn't it? Or is it? Do, I do remember there was some vague complication over all this, but perhaps Mr Deacon can remind. Um, well, the, the, the save policy itself is 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 obviously moving, um, continuing um, in, in this document. Yeah. I think with... Um, well, that site is actually under construction, I believe. So I wouldn't think that would put it in any different circumstances to any other extent planning permission with, un with under construction status. But if it was an allocation in the core strategy, wasn't it reflected in the settlement boundary at the time? That's what I'm thinking is a bit odd. Why wasn't the, why wasn't the policies map, why wasn't it shown within the settlement boundary of the policies map at the time? I would need to double check the policies map at the time, but I don't believe allocations are included in settlement boundaries. Right. So I, perhaps I don't know the specifics of the circumstance, but it's um, not unusual um, in some plans that allocations are effectively shown, let's say, as a red blob or a blue blob but outside of settlement boundaries and it's only when they're then implemented that the settlement boundaries revised to take account of them different plans i think have taken different approaches on that some have cast the net wider and brought everything that's an allocation into a settlement boundaries some don't and i have to say i don't know the detail of this but we can look at that and clarify that to you yeah if you could come back on well this chilton side in particular but any other there are a small, there's about three or four of them, aren't there, mm. I think, of these yeah. allocate, saved mm. policy allocated sites and see whether, because I, I, well, yeah. yeah I think our come, understanding is, we'll, we'll double check that for you, but our understanding yeah. is that the allocations are outside the boundaries. Right. And okay. I, th and I think so. What, what we wouldn't really want uh, to have to do, obviously, unless you, you recommended that we needed to do it, was to be drawn into, as it were, a partial review of settlement boundaries in some cases, because we think that's not really going to be very helpful. What we would like to do is to do a, a review and then revise all, all boundaries as appropriate on the outcome of that review. Yeah, what, what would be helpful to understand in the first place is which sites it is, um, and which plan it is and what or plans it is that these come from and what it says about, well, I mean, I can look that myself mm. once I know where it is, but mm. what they say about, um, you know, I mean, it's not going to say this isn't in the settlement boundary because, but the context of that decision, if it is right that they weren't mm. in, in, put in the settlement boundary, it would just be interesting to know that. So, um, yeah. OK, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, so that's dealt with uh, one to, uh, sorry, two to nine. So we'll go back to, um, let me just note that down. Uh, um, go back to um, question one, um, which is this argument that had been put by uh, some uh, representatives that plan um, 
is so fundamentally um, flawed um, that it can't be modified to make it um, sound. Um, and there was a number of sub points to this that sort of go through. Um, I mean, I think the first point that was uh, made, and I think this was made by um, Hopkins, was that the plan um, has no um, purpose. Um, so I suppose my thought on that, and seek, seek your uh, thoughts on it, uh, if Hopkins want to comment on that or anybody else, um, it sets a housing uh, requirement figure and it includes up-to-date development management policies um, across the two districts, replacing ones that are, you know, uh, in some cases, I think, getting on for 20 odd years um, old or more. Um, is that not a purpose? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, Gladman or um, I think it was Gladman or Hopkins who made the points in particular. Uh, Mr Jones. Uh, just to come back on, I think on the housing requirement point, the, uh, the point there was, was was that the housing requirement is, is set in national policy anyway. Um, so well, therefore... it isn't, is it? It, 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 it isn't. The national policy says this is the figure you should be looking to unless you've got reasons to have it higher or, or there's good reasons to have it higher or lower. And what it would well, say well, in, 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 this situ in this situation, in, in development management terms, it would it would be the, 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 yeah. the standard method would, would, would be exactly the same. Uh, and and all, all the you know the housing requirement is is, is being met by existing commitments. Um, so I don't in in at least in housing supply and 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 planning planning terms in that respect. I, I don't really see that it does have much of a purpose. It doesn't it doesn't change doesn't change anything. Um, but there are it's not just housing. Uh, development is there is planning beyond housing development and there is development management policies that apply to to other forms of development householder development as well and any uh, windfalls that take place within settlement boundaries they need development management policies don't they and no they I appreciate that yeah, no, yeah there's a purpose in that respect yeah but not not necessarily in the housing supplier yeah. okay um and Gladman Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, I have a couple of points. Um, obviously, you, you've asked, you obviously mentioned our representation there. So, I, I, sorry if I jump ahead. Um, if you have a, another sub question you're going to ask, um, I probably have, but is it? Yeah, it, so it, I was going to. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, is it on the particular point of the, whether or not there's a purpose? If not, will if if not, I'll probably be coming to your point anyway. But okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll save it. Thank you. OK, thanks. Well, I, what I'll do, just so, yeah, I'll go through all of uh, the key points I think there are. And then um, if there's any further points um, that you want to make, then 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 feel free at that stage. Um, a deal. Is this on whether the plan has a purpose? <laughs> a deal. Uh, yes, I just, I just wanted to agree with you because this isn't just about building houses. Um, these are rural areas and it's all about um you know, policies for the rural. There's also employment policies in there. Um, it isn't just about building houses. It's about um, the whole spectrum. And therefore, there is a purpose to this plan. OK, thank you. Um, so the second point concerns um, the, the, the post adoption um, life of the plan. And it's been pointed out that the MPPF says uh, a plan should have uh, a 15 year post adoption life and look forward over um, 30 years, which um, almost certainly uh, at the soonest adoption, this plan wouldn't have a post, um, a 15 year post adoption life. It would be, I think, probably at best about 14 uh, years. Um, I think this was a point of Gladman's. I suppose, yes, that's what the MPPF says. Um, I suppose my question would be, which is better? A plan with 14 years post-adoption life or no plan at all, because that's that's the alternative, isn't it? No plan at all, which is which is better. Um, well, I, th I think I sat on our representation, sir. I think in our view, it probably needs it. And probably answering one of your later questions is well, we in our view it needs starting again because um, you obviously talked there about in some reference to the other other questions about the evidence base, 
and things like that and what this plan can't do and, and in the previous sessions we had so you obviously had concerns about the evidence base we can't now use that same evidence base to say this plan is is up to date and correct and sound because you sir have said that evidence base wasn't sufficient to justify the approach taken so my concern there is that we're sort of saying something wasn't too, wasn't fit for purpose but now somehow it is although i think the bit that the, the 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 evidence base that we have concerns about relates to um the uh the housing site selection process of the spatial strategy and those parts have been taken out of the plan that was why they were taken out of the plan we're we're not saying that we've got we've got concerns about uh 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 other aspects of the i, I hesitate to say that because i'm, I'm not into that the, there might be some time but, but on the whole um we haven't got any concerns about the evidence base so so yeah. I, I i think well i think it then goes to our points that we put in our representations so about then what does what does what does the mppf say um about what what a local plan should do and it set out paragraphs starting at the plan making framework that, and it goes on to say that the development plan must include so it isn't it should it is a the development plan must include strategic policies to address each local planning authority's priorities for the development and use of land in its area and then obviously it goes on then at 20 to 23 about what those what they sh what those policies should do this plan doesn't do that first point in paragraph 17 and then by inference then doesn't do what paragraphs 20 to 23 do um, and Mr. Um, Bedford earlier mentioned about um, Section 19 of the 2004 Act. Um, in that, Section 19 Part 2 says um, the Berlin Plan must have regard to national policies um, as, as set, national planning policies. The MPPF is the English planning system's policies or the government's view on what English planning policy is in England. The, the Council's approach now doesn't meet those requirements. So I don't see that it meets that 2004 Act requirement. OK, but is it not the case that the, the it, 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 it says the development plan shall do that? This is the proposed part one plan is part of the development plan and the L it and the LDS say that um, that the spatial strategy will be dealt with in the part two uh, plan, part of uh, the development plan so it's not as if this plan would be adopted um with you know saying uh this that this plan here deals with the spatial strategy when it doesn't it makes absolutely clear that it doesn't and won't and that will come in the future so yes there isn't a spatial strategy at the moment but there is intended to be one in the future if this plan was chucked out altogether, there still wouldn't be a spatial strategy and there might be a plan in the future that does it. But I, I don't understand where the difference, uh, you know, wh where does it get you by getting rid of this plan? You still haven't got a, a plan with a spatial strategy. Yeah, so as, and as Mr Bedford mentioned when I made my point earlier about um, uh, what should happen to the sites that would then be contrary to this plan, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, in my view, I think the adoption of a new plan probably would be quite a significant material consideration. Therefore, at the moment, what the council can do is, you know, as, as again, as Mr. Bedford pointed out, it doesn't simply because something's out of date, you don't necessarily subscribe no weight to it. But again, using my example of where I was a minute ago, that where you have a new adopted plan, you're going to have sites that are contrary to it, and therefore that is quite a significant material change in circumstances. I know the council can. Yeah, view what it wants in terms of material consideration but obviously i think the adoption of a new plan is quite a significant one whereas at the moment the council in effect has a has a greater control over what it's doing because as i say for those sites that i've mentioned they would then be contrary to an up-to-date plan okay um thank you uh and uh, mr jones thank you sir um, just to come back to your, your question was, uh, is, was it better to have a, an adopted local plan now uh, with a part two coming forward or, or, to, or to start again uh, with a plan? Obviously, if you got the local plan now, the part one local plan now will only have 14 years um, to play, um, but the, it doesn't cover all of the strategic policies 
necessary. So it doesn't have a, a spatial uh, element at all in terms of the distribution of housing. Um, so there's not necessarily any confidence that you know, if the council take maybe two to three years to do their part two local plan, that that part two local plan could be found sound against MPPF paragraph, whatever it is, uh, 22 in terms of the 15 year um, period for adoption, because that plan, part two local plan, would have to set strategic policies. And those strategic policies are supposed to look ahead over a minimum period of 15 years. Um, so in terms of yeah, whether it's better to start again or not, I think it, it you know it is better at this point to start again with a, with a truly um, you know strategic plan that does look ahead over 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 a suitable you know fifteen to twenty year period from adoption, and um, and genuinely deals with <laughs> the sustainable pattern of development. The plan doesn't deal with that. The plan. So 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 in a in a in a system which the MPPF says it is a plan led uh, system and and sets out um, lots of requirements for plans. One of one important one of which is uh, uh, you should have a 15 year post uh, adoption life. You're saying that it's better to have no plan at all than one that's got a 14 year life. I'm saying it's better to have a plan that genuinely plans for a strategic and sustainable distribution of development over a strategic length of plan period rather than the plan that simply sets a housing requirement that is covered by national policy anyway and doesn't allocate any development because it's covered by existing planning commissions and therefore isn't really a spatial plan in any sense as adopted at this stage or as would be adopted. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, Mr Brown. Brown, did you want to speak? We can't hear Sorry, you. Sir. <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me now, sir? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me see me as well, sir. Sorry about that. That's um, right. Now see you and hear you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to try and be brief, and it has been touched upon, but I think it's it, it, this for me is very important. Um, and it confirms, uh, as has been uh, referred to, paragraph <coughs> 20 of the framework. I, so I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to read it, but it, but it seems to me it's important because it, it confirms that strategic policies <coughs> should set out an overall strategy and make sufficient provision for housing and affordable employment, retail, leisure, other commercial uh, infrastructure uh, and community facilities, the most important of which is schools. Um, seems to me that this paragraph makes clear that the strategic policies that should be included um, should address a, a, a range of not just housing, <clears throat> but other uses. And the point, sir, I make, which has been previously made, is that <clears throat> The housing requirements sh should not be limited uh, to open market housing. Um, a local plan should not be concerned simply with the uh, quantum of housing, but also where it's to be located and the range and type of housing to meet the needs of all groups of people. And the approach in the main modifications to this part, part plan, part one plan, singularly fails to do this. All that we have, sir, is a position whereby um, it has been discussed, but Plan 1 makes no allocations for housing. It also has no coherent strategy in terms of settlement hierarchy for the location of housing, and it doesn't provide any adequate policy basis for delivering uh, housing that will meet the needs of all, whether for, for, whether for the elderly those with disabilities or in the need of care in varying degrees. <clears throat> it seems to me, sir, as well, if I can just go back to, to, to your letter of 9th December, that you do mention, um, you say that part two is likely to contain an up-to-date robust, robust settlement hierarchy, a, a spatial distribution for any housing allocations. 
seems to me, sir, that specifically uh, a part one plan should, out, should set out those strategic policies, uh, the settlement hierarchy, what, what the requirement is for housing uh, and employment, as well as the broad locations for where development uh, would be acceptable. OK, and I mean, the, the same question that I've asked of others, which is given that the plan doesn't do that, is it better to have a plan that doesn't do that with a, uh, a, a commitment to do that in the part two plan or no plan at all? Are you saying that there should be no plan at all? Uh, I'm in that school, sir. Right. <clears throat> OK, uh, thank you. Um, the other point that's been raised, I think, by Gladman is uh, the unmet needs of Ipswich. And this was discussed back in two years ago. Um, and I can't remember whether I think at the time the, the, the Ipswich plan wasn't adopted at the time, I don't think, but it um, it, it, it has been now. Um, I mean, has anything changed? I don't want to get into the details of talking all about the potential of that, but has anything changed in since that, that suddenly shows that the, the, the needs of Ipswich uh, are now going to be need to be uh, met in in the na in the neighbouring authorities. I'm just I was just wondering why it was mentioned as something you, you know that makes this plan unsound. I don't have anything further to add on that, sir. I think I think things have moved on in terms of what um, the the plan is doing. Um, and obviously, I have my other fundamental concerns, and I think I, I share with Mr. what Mr. Brown spoke about there about um, how that's done. But um, I think the, the link to um, the Ipswich fringe area, which is one of the I think one of the things you raised as a concern about how the how the distribution of development goes. There's obviously a link between the Ipswich fringe and the, the spatial strategy across the two districts. Um, so, don't have any specific comment on further on the unmet needs of Ipswich. But obviously, I think that that, that link to that spatial strategy point is important about yeah. the council putting the Ipswich fringe at the top of the heart settlement hierarchy um, as as previous. And then obviously with the issues that you mentioned. In the OK. Last sessions. OK. And in terms of I think you also raise um, forthcoming forthcoming planning reform and you said that justifies withdrawal of the plan and, you know, starting afresh with a completely new plan. Um, I mean, we don't know we have no legislation for that um at the moment and we don't know uh when it's going to happen or even if it's going to happen um if the council were to withdraw this plan now they wouldn't be able to do anything in preparation of a new plan because they wouldn't know uh well they would if they were to progress now they would have to progress under the current uh current legislation because that's all there is isn't it they wouldn't be able to start on a new plan under the new system because we don't know what the new system is yeah, and I think I think so. That when we when 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 this was drafted, I think we had anticipated that new NPPF um, might have progressed. It obviously hasn't, but at the moment, as I say, it doesn't even comply with the current NPPF. So um, um, that my, my problem is more fundamental with that than anything in the future. It doesn't comply with the current national policy, and that's why it's fundamentally not sound. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Martin Edwards. Sorry, uh, Mr. Martin Edwards. Thank you, sir. It was just to come back on one of the points that you'd uh, you'd raised earlier. I think Mr. Brown was was talking this through uh, in in relation to, uh, uh, to 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 spatial planning and uh, part one and part two. What we know is uh, a local plan is meant to uh, identify uh, specific policies and specific sites for its growth over a, a period of time. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things we may well uh, agree on, not perhaps everyone around the room uh, this morning, is that some plan is probably better than, than no plan. Uh, I think that's something we could get behind. However, uh, a commitment from the council rather than just verbal, if you, if you excuse, excuse that, sir, that actually gives us an indication of when we will be expecting the part two of the plan that fills the whole element of, of the local plan would be very, very beneficial uh, as well. We talked about possibly an early review. I know that there was perhaps a, a, a bit of a kickback from, from Mr Bedford uh, earlier on, but if there was a, a commitment to an early review, that may well catch itself up with the commitment to the, uh, to the sites as well. 
So all of a sudden, potentially, potentially, Baber and Mid Suffolk have a, a, a conjoined local plan uh, in uh, the next two, two and a half years or whatever that might be. But I think the key thing here is at the moment, and it goes back to the, some of the comments that we raised earlier on, particularly in uh, uh, parts of question two, it's about a firm commitment to a time frame, and that's really what a lot of people around this table today are looking for. Thank you. OK, thank you. And uh, Richard Winsborough. Hi, um, yeah, just to agree with what uh, Mr. Martin Edwards was saying then. Is it possible for, for part two or even part one to reference actually looking beyond um, the end of the uh, plan period? Yeah, I mean, part, part of I mean, my thinking on this, and I, I mean, to my mind, and this is entirely within the uh, the the the, uh, the gift of, of of the council, really. But to my mind, it's quite likely that the part two plan would become a, a review of this plan and a part two plan all at the same time. I would imagine, <laughs> um, but who knows? So that may well be doing it. But uh, does that need to be said now? Because that that then makes it well that that then makes it a review of this plan. But if you say that it's going to look further into the future, that then makes it a review of this plan rather than a part two plan, doesn't it? Um, and as has been said, planning reform is in the offing. So who knows what will happen? But um, yeah, well, I'll give some consideration to the 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 wording around all that, and um, yeah interested to see what the council have to say on that perhaps wrapping up at the uh at the end on on, on on this point um just in terms of, i just wanted to ask what i think one further point on this unless there's anything else from others but which was related to the um the age of the evidence um it's pointed out that the schmars updates four years old um the economic needs assessment is six years old and the retail evidence is um eight years old um none of which is bang up to date um i think this was a hopkins um point um but in relation to this i suppose i would say again the question not ideal but is is no plan better than a uh than than uh, a plan with some evidence that will need updating in due course Mr. Jones. Uh, nothing further to add in terms of the age of the evidence. Uh, um, I think that's set out in our written representations. Um, just to come back on a point you did mention earlier, though, in terms of your assumption that the part two plan and a full review of the local plan would come forward together as one. Well, not, an assume... assum not an assumption, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 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 and imagining that it might. <laughs> it, 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 it's possible. Uh, I would assume that, that quite the opposite would happen and that, that the council would have you know, an adopted local plan that said they didn't, particularly at this stage, have to plan for, for a longer period of the future and that they would want to, to, to hold on to that in, in my experience of how, how, how these things work. But there we go. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Probably not. Well, not even the council themselves will know at the moment. Um, OK, uh, Mr Baker. Uh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think it's quite uh, our, our comments and concerns are with regards to the age of the evidence base. Um, but specifically, I know the, the topic of conversation and debate today has been around housing. But as, as I think you correctly mentioned and others mentioned, um, the part one local plan does cover you know, uh, other, other areas, including uh, the uh, delivery uh, of, of employment land. And I think for, for, for us, I think it, the current approach set out under main modification one uh, is for the part two of the local plan to include matters pertaining to predominantly spatial strategy for the delivery of housing. We've discussed it, settlement boundaries, hierarchy, allocations, distribution, etc. Um, however, there is no inclusion uh, of any matters concerning economic uh, and employment development. Thus, the proposed approach uh, to employment land as drafted in the part one local plan will seemingly uh, at this stage be the sole mechanism for the delivery of new employment land over the proposed plan period. 
I think our concerns with this are twofold uh, in terms of soundness. Um, I think whilst at the time of matter six hearing session, which concerned employment, retail, uh, town centre and tourism policies in September 21, the evidence base comprised economic needs assessment 2016 publication uh, and the Ipswich Economic Area Sector Needs Assessment Final Report uh, in 2017 uh, and determined that the need at that point was some 12.1 hectares. Um, we have concerns over the validity and the reliability of this evidence base and I think our primary concerns relate to the change in micro and macroeconomic circumstances uh, since the publication of this evidence base and clearly the time that has elapsed since. Um, we provided detail in our representations, uh, so we won't, I won't go over in full detail here, but, but, but clearly to summarise, uh, the economic evidence base for which Local Part 1 is based upon, uh, and in effect is the economic spatial strategy for delivering employment land, uh, does not account for the impacts of COVID-19 uh, and the structural shifts in, for example, the storage and distribution sectors. Uh, the impact of what's going on in terms of Ukraine war, cost of living crisis, as well as increasing demand and volumes uh, of traffic at Felixstowe Port uh, and the implications for employment across the district. Um, indeed, uh, you, you, sir, expressed concerns in your communication to the Council in April 22 uh, of the potential risk that the evidence base was becoming out of date. Um, uh, refer you to your, your what, the core document G11 in this regard. Um, so I think we we know that the draft approach to the delivery of employment land within part one of the local plan is governed by uh, policy SP05, um, in which the evidence base confirms that the demand for employment space over the plan period can be adequately addressed through recorded vacancies uh, in existing strategic employment sites within the district uh, and speculative planning permissions that have come forward. Um, however, should the economic spatial strategy be based upon uh, what's now a considerably out of date uh, evidence base, there is no certainty that sufficient employment land uh, will be delivered throughout the plan period. And I think this would cast doubt over whether the local plan would be you know, based on uh, appropriate evidence and deliverable, uh, and thus would it be justified and effective uh, as per the MPPF tests of soundness. Um, now, what we suggested, uh, sir, in our representations is we consider there, and this has been discussed with regards to housing, but in terms of employment, um, we consider there to be an appropriate review mechanism as, as, as a remedy to be inserted in the part one local plan. Clearly, um, there's a reluctance uh, from yourselves and, and some around the table that any further delays of the part one local plan um, to in effect request the council to undertake a review of their economic evidence base during this examination um, might not be in the best interests. Um, however, referring to our representations, uh, we see, uh, well, uh, our client seeks to insert a review mechanism into the wording of draft policy SP05 that which effectively requires an immediate uh, review of the employment evidence base. Um, equally, um, inserting employment land um, and, and a review of this econ economic evidence base into uh, the matters listed uh, at 0108 of main modification one, i.e. what the part two local plan will uh, cover and address will also be an appropriate mechanism to uh, review employment need, vacancy rates of existing strategic sites uh, and any need for any further employment allocations. Thank you. OK, um, I mean, you, you, you referred there to 0108 paragraph, yeah. which does say the last bullet point, which is other matters which are considered necessary by the councils, depending upon the monitoring of the plan and the circumstances at the time. So it does. It doesn't it, it, it isn't um, it isn't exclusive. It's whatever else is necessary uh, at the time. And I suppose you could, yeah. You could argue if if you do come up with a very formal policy that says this um, this plan will look at X, Y, and Z, then uh, that almost then mitigates against anything other than X, Y, and Z being dealt with, doesn't it? So so um, that that that's almost an argument to not have a review policy. But do you have concerns that that 
that last bullet point of 0108 doesn't go, well, presumably you do have concerns that that doesn't go far enough and you think it should specifically refer to. Yeah, I, I think so. More, more so because you know, clearly there that, that is a provision in of itself that, um, you know, yes, it, economic land review of its evidence base, employment land delivery could come forward under that. However, I think we just have concerns that clearly the focus, um, uh, as has been heard at today's session, uh, is the, the spatial structure <coughs> of, delivery of housing. Um, uh, and, and and that's clearly the, the focus. That's clearly one of, if not the priorities around the table. Clearly for us, we're concerned that, you know, employment land um, with the provision of SP05 as it's currently drafted, um, the council may decide that that is sufficient. Um, and we simply don't, we, we want a, a more of a formal commitment. I think uh, uh, commitment is the key word that has been debated uh, at length today. Um, so I think, yes, it, it could, uh, I, I, I agree, it could be covered under that, but I think it needs more of a uh, formal commitment to to guarantee that, that certainty of delivery over the plan period. OK, um, thanks for that. Just just looking at that last bullet point, I'm going going off that point slightly, but um, looking to the council on this. Um, and I wonder if it's to some degree it, it, it gets to the heart of some of the concerns of the uh, some people in the room or in the virtual room. Um, it says other matters which are considered necessary by the councils. And I wondered we don't really need the words by the councils there, do we? And that does imply that, I mean, in the end, it will be as determined by the councils because it's the council's plan and you'll put it uh, you'll put it in, but it has to be found sound. Um, I'm wondering about a slight tweak to that. I, I, I would think about that. Presumably you wouldn't have a, a massive problem if that was slight, slightly tweaked to sort of give more of a sense that it's the other issues that, need to be reviewed at that time type of thing rather than necessary as deemed necessary by the councils and presumably you wouldn't have a massive problem with that and it, it 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 doesn't it doesn't hugely change anything but it's just a slightly different tone isn't it so i i think if that um takes us to a further position forward that would be fine with us i mean just just in terms of the employment evidence i mean i can confirm um as, as i think i alluded to earlier on that that evidence base is being worked upon at the moment um, so it is already underway, um, albeit it's very early days and, and we can't predict the outcome of that and what that means for the part two document, but that work is ongoing. OK, thanks. And uh, Mr Brown. So I'll be brief. Um, could, could I just also mention about need and if I could just refer you to paragraph 60 uh, of the frame of the framework? Um, that, that uh, mentions about the, uh, the the needs of groups with specific housing requirements are are, are, are addressed, um, and perhaps I could also just mention, sir, that the <clears throat> in the context of uh, uh, of care homes uh, and care or retirement accommodation, which is what I'm specifically referring to, that the that the the PPG relating to uh, uh, housing for the elderly <clears throat> it, it refers to the need to provide housing for older people being um, critical um, so if you have to hand the plan there I just wondered if I could refer you to paragraph 13.17 and <clears throat> that <clears throat> That confirms, sir, the um, uh, 1317. Just if I've just found the crossed out 1317, I'm just looking for the um, yeah. I'm just looking for the uh, replaced 1317. It's crossed uh, out 1331. Yeah, 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 got got it. So it confirms the council, well, the council confirm uh, about the uh, 1,005 additional specialist units will be needed in Mid-Suffolk, then gives uh, the, the breakdown. It also then confirms uh, an additional requirement for care, nursing and residential care home and mentions that the Schmar uh, identifies there'll be a requirement uh, for 1,670 people 
uh, in, in Ms Suffolk then confirms uh, the additional care accommodation. Um, <clears throat> it, it's the council's figures, sir, and I'll just make the point um, that this plan uh, d does not propose any policies that relate to the allocations of sites for uh, care homes or care uh, or retirement accommodation. And I I think that that's significant, sir. And I think that um, uh, puts this plan in conflict with, uh, as I say, paragraph 60, sir. Uh, OK, thank you. Right. Is there anything else that anybody wants to raise in relation to question one or matter one? Right. OK, no. Um, well, that then. So, so, we, everything. so we're you going to invite the council to then comment on everything. Oh. Before. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, 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 I was sort of thinking you would put your uh, your hand up, but yeah, you didn't. Yeah. Um, you, you didn't. So I assumed you didn't want to say anything. Yeah. That's fine. Um, yeah. uh, off you go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I only wanted to uh, pick up on uh, a couple of points, because in a sense, I think you, you fully understand our position uh, and what we see as being the need for a pragmatic uh, approach rather than, as it were, uh, an idealistic uh, approach, and we, we're certainly of the view that uh, a plan uh, is is preferable uh, to no plan, even if uh, the part one plan uh, is not itself um, as comprehensive as obviously some of the participants uh, would wish it to be. Um, just picking up on a small point um, that Mr Brown made, it seemed in terms of specialist uh, housing needs, LPO6 uh, does address specialist housing needs, albeit not by allocations, because clearly uh, the thrust of the uh, main modifications to not make allocations uh, for the reasons already rehearsed. Uh, but then uh, if I could then pick up on, uh, I think, the points made partly by Mr Carvel and partly by Mr Jones in terms of the NPPF uh, and the extent to which this plan uh, complies uh, with the advice, particularly at paragraph 17 and then 20 to 23. So what we would say about that is that those paragraphs of the MPPF dealing with what uh, um, the strategic policies of development plans should do, those paragraphs clearly need to be read in the context of the legislative framework provided by the 2004 Act uh, and albeit that I am repeating a point that I made earlier it is absolutely clear uh, and I do reference section 19 brackets 1c that it is entirely permissible to deliver on your strategic policies taking the development plan as a whole, let's say the suite of documents that make up the development plan. And that's why the phrase taken as a whole is included in those statutory provisions. So when section 19.2 requires you to have regard to the Secretary of State's policies, which means effectively the MPPF, you can do that through your suite of development plan policies, through your suite of development plan documents. Um, and Again, we, we've made no bones about it, that as it were, in an ideal world, it would have been better to have a single uh, local plan to capture everything. That's what we obviously started out the journey trying to do. Obviously, you uh, uh, perfectly within your remit, because you're charged with considering the soundness of what we were doing, you had concerns about some elements of that. Uh, and so wanted to see those elements excised from the part one plan uh, and left over to be properly considered further through the part two plan. I say working with the grain of that has led to uh, the main modifications uh, and the position we're now in. But we don't see any of that as, uh, uh, as leading to a conclusion that what we're doing is outside of what's uh, uh, permissible within the MPPF or outside of what is permissible within the legislation. 
And so if you then go back to question one uh, and ask yourself uh, uh, in terms of the issue, is, is the plan so fundamentally flawed that it cannot be modified? Uh, and we would say, well, the answer is quite clearly no, it is not so fundamentally flawed. It does have some weaknesses, as you have uh, um, identified from your assessment. They're capable of being addressed in the targeted way uh, that you have um, uh, um, uh, suggested that the council look at through the main modifications. Um, and uh, we also note, uh, and it's perhaps just worth a point picking up on, uh, you remember that Mr Jones, when you asked him specifically, about whether or not there was a purpose to be served by having a plan rather than no plan, albeit that uh, Mr Jones uh, was of the view uh, that a housing requirement alone wouldn't justify having this plan. Uh, he made it very clear that there is a purpose in having the up-to-date development management policies. Um, in a sense, almost irrespective of all of the other arguments, it's helpful uh, both to the communities and those wishing to bring forward development within the plans areas to have up-to-date development management policies in place. That can be achieved by the part one plan, uh, but recognising, of course, the part two plan will then provide uh, the bits which are uh, not um, present in this plan. So, so we would say, I say the answer to question one is absolutely clear. Uh, this is not a case where you should, as it were, throw the baby out with the bathwater and reject everything uh, in order to pursue, as it were, the perfect plan, which seemed to be what some of the uh, representations were directing you towards. Um, so I don't know, I'll just check whether Mr Deakin wanted to make any further wrap up comments. I see, I think he's saying no. So, so those are the points we uh, ask you to bear in mind. OK, uh, thank you very much um, for that. Well, that's perfectly timed us to finish at uh, one o'clock, so we won't need to come back uh, this afternoon, which I'm sure will please everybody. Thank you all uh, very much for your contributions. Um, plenty for uh, my colleague and I to uh, consider. So thank you for um, taking part and uh, good afternoon. <laughs>